chapter 25. Tim's head hurt. His legs hurt. His arms hurt. Even his eyes and his ears hurt. Everything hurt. He was sprawled on the floor in a tangle of limbs, itching all over. He couldn't remember how he came to be here or why. He couldn't think of anything except the pain. Tim sat up. That was a mistake. Now everything hurt even more. He clutched his skull with both hands and gently rubbed his scalp with the thin tips of his fingers. The pain didn't go away. There was something else too. He didn't just feel the pain. He could hear it. A strange buzzing noise echoed round his head as if a bee had flown through his mouth and taken out residence inside his skull. The last thing he remembered was seeing a big tree coming towards him at great speed. Oh yes, now he remembered how he came to be lying here covered in cuts and bruises. Bruises. He knew what had happened. The buzzing grew louder. It wasn't coming from inside his head. He had a sl- sl- swallowed a bee. Maybe a web's nest had fallen from the tree. Or her- perhaps a petrol was hissing out of tank under the set. Any second now, a spark would inject the farms. The bullet would explode in a roar of flame. Time to move, thought Tim. Time to get out of here. The buzzing got louder every second. Down at the other end of the cockpit, Girk was squatting on the floor, licking himself. He lifted his head, glanced at Tim for a moment, then went back to licking himself. Tim stood up slowly. His slugs hurt. His arms hurt and his head hurt. But he didn't fall over. There was a loud noise behind him, a kind of whoosh or a whistle, followed by a loud bang. He turned around, searching for the causes, cause of noise. There was another whoosh and another bang. A small hole appeared in the metal beside his head. Tim stared at the hole. How that had happened? Holes can't just appear. What did it come from? And then it happened again. A whoosh, a bang, another hole appeared in the metal. It was followed by another and another until a line of holes ran along the cockpit and Tim realized that someone was shooting at him. He ducked. More bullets whistled overhead. Some were smashed into the boot. Others sodded into the trunks of the surrounding palm trees or whistled into the jungle. Someone was shooting at him. With bullets, real bullets, and why? It must be a mistake, a simple case of mistaken identity. They must think he was a thief or a bandit. Tim knew that he had two options. Option number one, he could surrender. He could stand up in the middle of the boat with his arms raised and hope they stopped shooting. He could beg for mercy. He could explain that someone somewhere had made a terrible mistake. He could ask why on earth anyone would want to shoot us at a small boy and an even smaller dog. Option number two. He could just run. He just run. Come on, he yelled to Greg. Let's go this way. Tim vaulted over the front of the boot and sprinted across the sand. Greg sprinted after him. Bullets sprayed the beach, pr- pr- pushing them, creating little splashes of sand around their feet, pounding holes in the nearby tree trunks. Tim's arms and legs still hurt. He was still covered in cuts and cuts and bruises, but that didn't stop him running as fast as he had ever run in his life. It was funny how fast you can run when someone is shooting at you. Tim and Gert sprinted between the trunks of two huge palm trees. Blocking their way, there was a large white sign painted with black letters. Tim did not have time to read what it said. He just sped around the side and charged into the forest. Gert ducked under the sign and ran after them. After Tim. Behind them, bullets sprayed the sand, the trees, the undergrowth, and the sign pun- puncturing the white metal peppering the black letters with a hundred holes, but the bullets didn't manage to destroy all the letters. If you had clambered up the stand after Tim, you still could have read what they said. Trespassers will be persecuted. The sign did not tell the truth, of course. The sign didn't say that trespassers would be shot, but Andrew Goliath had not become one of the richest men on the planet by telling the truth. 
the end of chapter 25. Chapter 26. As the Zodiac approached the shore, the guard at the back caught the engine. At the front of the Zodiac, the other two guards were poised to jump. They, star they stared at the shore, searching the trees and the rocks. Any second now, they knew a shot might ring out. Bullets may might spray the air. They could be sailing straight into an ambush. The three guards weren't quite sure what they had seen. When a zodiac spurts spurt through the sea at high speed, its nose leaps out of the water. It leaps over waves, and its passengers are thrown from side to side, so they can't aim their weapons or their binoculars. That was why the guard with the gun had been able to plant a bullet between team shoulder blades, and that was why exactly how many men had invaded the island. They didn't know if they were facing a dozy fisherman who had accidentally run his boat aboard or a small army of pirates. They drank the zo zodiac onto the beach and charged down the sand towards the red boat. The guard started at stared at the boat. The windscreen was completely smashed. The hole had been gashed open. Completely smashed. Oh, sorry, sorry. The windscreen was completely smashed. The hole had been gashed open. This boat wouldn't be going anywhere for a long time. There was a sudden noise from the jungle. The guards were around, raised their guns, and fired three, three streams of bullets into the trees. Feathers floated through the air. Some broken branches fell from the trees and crashed to the ground, followed by a dead bird. But no one fri fired back. One of the guards reached reached to his belt and removed a two-way radio. He switched it open. He switched it on. Alpha one, he said. Alpha one. Do you read me? The end of chapter 26. Chapter 27. T knew the island was small, so he was careful not to run too far. He didn't want to emerge on the other side and find himself in a house or barquettes or a harbor. Comfort, confronting more angrily men with guns. He ran until he couldn't hear any more shots. Then he ran a little more. And then he stopped in the middle of the jungle surrounded by trees. He turned around and stared back at the way that he had come. Gurk sat at Tim's feet, watching Tim's face, waiting to see what he would do next. They stayed absolutely still. It was quiet. He stood like that for a long time, listening for any unusual noise, a footstep, a shoot, a shot, or a breaking branch. Around them, the jungle slowly came to life. Insects crawled along the ground. A butterfly dwelled through the air. A bright red bird flittered between the trees, a flash of scarlet against the green leaves, flying too fast for him to see any details. But there was no sign of sound or, uh, or sign or sound of humility. No shits, no shots, and no footsteps. They hadn't been followed. Tim looked at Gerg and said, So, what are we doing going to do now? Gerg looked at him and waggled, wagged his tail, but he didn't offer any useful suggestion. I don't know which way to go, said Tim. I don't even know what I should be looking for. Gerg turned his head. He had smelled some. He had smelled something interesting. He ran to the nearest tree and started sniffing the trunk. Tim said, and we saw the boat. How are we going to get home? Gurk didn't look up. He was too busy snuffling around the tree. He could smell something unusual, something that he had never smelled before. He didn't know what it was, and he wasn't sure whether to be excited or terrified. But he kept sniffing, trying to locate the source of the smell. You're not a lot of help, said Tim. He stared into the jungle. The foliage was dark and mysterious. All the trees looked the same. Tim didn't know which way to go, but anything would be better than returning to the beach and the bullets. He walked onwards. Gurk sniffed the trunk once more and ran, then ran ahead, charging past him and...
darting ahead through the trees. He jumped over leaves and branches, then stopped and turned, his ears cocked, waiting for Tim to catch up. The end of chapter 27. Chapter 28 Edward Goliath's face was flushed bright red with fury. He had been listening to Toby Connett's explanation for two minutes and he'd had enough. I don't understand, he yelled. How did this happen? How did a boat get anywhere near the island, let alone crash on the beach? That afternoon, just like every afternoon, Eric Goliath was doing his afternoon exercises, watched by them, flew around the world with him, going wherever he when keeping him just about as healthy as it was possible for a 61-year-old man to be. They monitored his heartbeat, his respiration, and all his other vital statistics as he jogged, cycled, ran, swam, and worked through the machines in his private gym. But on that particular afternoon, unlike most afternoons, Goliath's exercise had been interrupted by the arrival of Toby Connaught, who had brought some bad news. A boat had been found on the other side of the island. The boat's octopus pants had vanished. The do- doctor, the trainer, and the nutritionist took several steps backwards. Earth's each of them shook their heads, climbed down, calmed down, they went on to say, Take a deep breath. If you make yourself so angry, you'll burst a blood vessel. You might even have a heart attack. But none of them said a word, not daring to interrupt their boss. The only person who dared speak was Toby Connacht. She said, We don't actually know how the book got here. You don't know? No, sir. What do you mean? How can you not know? There must have been a bridge of the sacral system. A bridge? What kind of bridge? They must have come under the radar, sir, and avoid the petrols and sneak past the cameras. They must be using extremely sophisticated equipment. This is ridiculous, said Goliath. Where are they now? We don't know, sir. And how many of them are there? We don't know that either, sir. Well, what do you know? Not a lot, sir. Quickly, Toby Connacht explained what the patrol had found on the beach on the other side of the island. They described the uh, smash boat and the figures who had been claims filled fleeing from the beach to the jungle. He explained that the interlopers couldn't have got far because the guards had radioed their report only a couple of minutes ago. He promised that they couldn't remain undiscovered for long. Mobiles, everyone, said Goliath, search the entire island. I want them found right now. Chapter 29 Tim and Gurk had been walking through the jungle for a few minutes, hoping over fallen branches and waving through the trees when they stumbled onto a road. Before Tim could choose whether to turn left or right or plunge onwards through the jungle, the decision was made for him. He heard the noise of the en- of an engine. A car was coming. He jumped back and hid behind a tree. Gurk sat in the middle of off the road, scratching his left ear with his right leg. Tim whistled, Hey, come here! Girl rolled over and scratched his right ear with his left leg. The noise of the engine was getting louder. The car must be just around the corner. Tim clapped his hands, Come on, girl, come on! Come here! Girl looked up. For a moment, he seemed to be considering which of his ears still needed scratching. Then he must have remembered that he had already scratched both of them because he bounced across the road and ran to Tim. Just as Gurg jumped out of the road and disappeared into the jungle, a jeep came racing round the corner. Tim kept perfectly still. He hoped Gurg hadn't been seen. Then there were three men in the jeep. One was driving the Others had binoculars slung around their necks and machine guns in their laps. The jeep whizzed down the road and skidded round the 
bed. When the noise of the engine had faded, Tim stepped out of the undergrowth. Kirk followed him. Tim looked up and down the road. Kirk sniffed the air. When both of them were satisfied, satisfied that the guards had gone and were not coming back, they, star- they started walking along the road, taking the opposite direction from the jeep. After a few minutes, they reached a cliff. Clearing in the jungle, Tim could see a single story brick building with a flat roof. Two jeeps and three bicycles were parked beside the building, but there was no sign of any people. Tim stayed very still, watching and listening. He didn't want to take any risk. When he was satisfied that the clearing was empty, he walked slowly to- forwards, turning his head all the time, looking in every direction, checking for guards. Tim decided that he must be right in the middle of the island because he couldn't hear the sea. Overhead, the sky was blue, studded with wispy white clouds. The long, single-story building stood at one edge of the clearing. It was a wooden store. On the other side of the clearing, there were three large green rocks. Gurk ran towards the nearest rock. Not that way, kissed him. This way. Gurk glanced at him, then continued running towards the rock. Come back! T wanted to look at the building and peer through the window to see what was inside. He was interested in large green rocks. Come on, Gurk, here! Gurk took no notice. He reached the rock and sniffed it. Right, that is, that's it, said Tim. I'm putting you on the lead. He reached into his pocket, pulled out Gurk's lead, and ran across the clearing. He reached Gurk, but before he could attach the lead to Gurk's collar, something unexpected happened. The rock twitched. Tim stared. Gurk jumped backwards. Neither of them had ever seen a twitchy rock. The rock twitched again. A foot slid out from the bottom of the rock, followed almost immediately by a second foot. A long neck emerged from the other side of the rock. At the end of the neck, there was a large wrinkled head which shone slowly towards Tim and Gurk. Two big black eyes stared at them with a quizzical impression. Tim and Gurk stared back. Neither of them had ever seen a, such an extraordinary creature. It was an enormous tortoise. Tim didn't know much about tortoise, but there was one thing that he knew for sure. This was the biggest tortoise that he had ever seen. He had never even imagined, imagined that such a huge tortoise exists anywhere on the planet. The enormous tortoise had thick skin, wide legs, a, ha- a huge shell, a long bendy neck, and a big bulbous head. Its eyes were dark and mysterious. Tim had always thought of tortoise as small creatures which lived in people's back gardens and hibernated in cardboard boxes during the winter. But here was an enormous tortoise, a tortoise as big as an armchair. Um, armchair. He didn't know if enormous turtles had poisonous fangs or sharp teeth or long claws. He didn't. He he didn't know if they were blustery car- carnivores or kind-hearted vegetarians. He didn't know if they ate grass or leaves or worms or dogs or boys. Whatever their dietary habits, he could imagine how they would react to the unexpected arrival of a boy and a dog, and he wasn't sure that he wanted to find out. But Gurk seemed quite intrigued. He wanted to know more about this curious creature. His tail wagged slowly back and forth. The tortoise bent his head towards the ground. Gurk lifted his nose and sniffed the tortoise's wrinkled skin. Tim turned his head. He could hear something. He listened out for a second. That identified the noise. It was an engine. The jeep was coming back. This time, he didn't take any chances. The noise of the em- engine was quickly getting louder. Tim didn't want to get trapped between the soldiers and the tortoise. He attached the lead to Gert's collar and pulled him towards the trees. Gert reluctantly followed him, turning his head every few paces to turn 
and stare at the tourists. The tourists stared back. The end of chapter twenty nine. Tim and Gurk lurk behind a large palm tree, peering round the side of the trunk. The noise of the approaching engine grew louder. A jeep emerged into the clearing. Two men in white coats sat in the two front seats. They looked like scientists. They parked the jeep and switched off the engine. In the silence, Tim could hear the sound of his own breathing and Gurk's panting. These two scientists left their ship and walked across the grass to the nearest tortoise. Both men leaned down to inspect it. The first scientist tapped the tortoise shell. The second scientist touched the tortoise skull. They spoke a few words to one another and walked to the next tortoise and inspected that too. When the two scientists had made their inspections of the tortoise, they turned around. Tim was worried that they might have seen the, him, but they, they hadn't. They walked across the grass to the single-story building, opened the door, and went inside. The door swung shut after them. Tim waited for a couple of minutes, making sure that the two men weren't going to come straight out again, then darted towards the building. Gert ran after him. When Tim reached the building, he ran past the door and continued to the nearest window. Tucking down to the ground, he waited to catch his breath, then very slowly raised his body until his eyes were at the level of the window sill. He peered through the murky glass. On the other side of the window, he could see a large room running the whole length of the building. Apart from several silver cabinets leaned along one wall, the room appeared to be empty. That wasn't possible. The room couldn't be empty. The two men had just walked inside and hadn't come out. They must be tucked away at one of the one end of the building or the other, hidden from view. Tim put his face against the glass. He peered to the left, then the right. He couldn't see anyone. As far as he could tell, the room was completely empty. Tim was baffled. If the two scientists weren't inside the room, where had they gone? Come on, he hissed to Gert. This way. Together, they hurried all the way round the building, checking for exits. Two walls were blank. On the third wall, there was a door. The door which the two men had gone through. And on the fourth, there was a window, a window that Tim had been looking through. He looked through the window again. Nothing had changed. The room was still empty. It just didn't make sense. Tim had been watching the door and the two men hadn't emerged. They must still be inside, but they were inside. They had vanished. But two men can't just vanish, can they? Tim walked round the building and stood beside the door, followed by Gurk. He lifted his hand and wrapped his fingers around the handle. For a moment, he did nothing, unwilling to turn the handle, uncertain what he might find on the other side of the door. Worried that he was making a terrible mistake right now, he could just walk away, or he could hide among the trees and wait for a man to emerge, or he could turn the handle and go inside for bailing. Forcing himself to move, not allowing himself the opportunity to change his mind, he turned the handle. The door was locked. It was immediately. It opened immediately. He knew he was being foolish, but curiously it drove him forwards. He had the strange sense that a secret was here inside the book. Inside this building, waiting to be exposed. If he went through this door, he felt certain he would discover why Monster X had died. He would learn what Monster X's last word had meant. He would solve the mystery of Calypso Island. Tim paused for a moment, giving himself one last chance to turn and run. He waited for a raised voice. The angry shot. Of someone demanding to know what he was doing, but nothing came. Here it goes, thought Tim. He stepped inside the building. Gurk followed him. The door swung shut behind them. The end of chapter thirty. Chapter thirty one. Tim and Gurk were standing at the end of a long room. One wall was lined with metal cupboards, another wall was punctuated by a single window, and the third wall was blank. Apart from the cupboards, the room was empty. There was no sign of the two scientists. 
Tim looked at Gert. He said, What do you do now? Gert did an answer. He was sniffing the air, trying to identify a curious smell. You're not much help, said Tim. Gert just kept sniffing. There was something in the room which interred him. He, he ambled to the nearest wall and ran his nose along the floorboards, sniffing every knot and crevice. Tim looked around the room, searching for some sign of the two scientists, something to convince him that he hadn't simply dreamed their presence, but not couldn't see anything. But he couldn't see anything. Perhaps I'm going mad, said Tim. Perhaps I'm simply imagining them. But he couldn't think of any other explanation. Two men can simply walk into a room and then disappear. That's just not possible. He stared at the cupboards. Could the scientists be hiding inside them? The cupboards stared from the floor to the ceiling. Each one was wide enough to hold a human. But why would everyone choose to hide inside a cupboard? There was only one way to find out. Tim stretched out his arm, grabbed the handle of the nearest cupboard, and opened it. The door swung open. Cold air rushed out. The cupboard was a fridge. Inside, there were three shops stacked with what looked like white balls. They were the size of the size and shape of tennis balls. What were they? Tim could imagine all sorts of possibilities. They might have been bombs. They might have been candy-coated chocolate puddings. They might have been tiny croquet balls or massive golf, golf balls. Whatever they were, it was absolutely important to keep them at a steady temperature because each shelf had its own thermometer. Tim leaned forward. Gingerly using both hands, he picked up one of the bolts. It was cold and light and a little bit squishy. They knew immediately what what it was. He knew immediately what it was. An egg, a white egg. They weren't chicken eggs. They were too white and too round. Although he couldn't be certain, he guessed they must be tortoise eggs. Perhaps this was a laboratory devoted to studying tortoise and the two men in white coats really had been scientists, devoting their lives to saving giant tortoise from extinction. Tim suddenly felt guilty. He realized that he might easily have made a terrible mistake. If the men who work here were conservations and environmentalists, they were the good guys. He didn't want to be caught sneaking around their laboratory. They might think he was trying to harm their work. Tim put the egg back on the shelf and closed the door. He didn't want to damage the eggs. He felt depressed. He had failed to find what he was looking for. He had been hoping to uncover traces of criminal activity, but this building seemed like a scientific research center devoted to saving tortoises. For a moment, Tim considered walking out. Then he decided to do one last thing. He would look inside the other fridges. If they contained more eggs, just like the first one, he would know that he had been wrong to come here. He walked down the room to the next fridge, opened the door, and quickly peeked inside. He knew another three shelves stacked with eggs. He shut the door again, not wanting to damage the eggs, but all altering their temperature. He went along the line of fridges, opening their door. Five of the six cupboards were exactly the same. Each contained three shelves stacked with white eggs. Altogether, there must have been several hundred eggs crammed inside five fridges, enough to populate an entire town of tourists. But the sixth cupboard was different. When Tim opened the door of the sixth cupboard, he didn't feel a blast of cold air or see a row of shelves stacked with eggs. Instead, he saw an empty box, much like a cupboard without any shelves. The walls of this particular cupboard were made of shiny reflected metal. On the left-hand wall, there were two buttons, one above the other. The uppermost button was blue and the lower button was red.
It might have been an empty space waiting for a fridge to be fitted inside, or turns out it might be something else completely. Looking at the two buttons, the red and the blue, the, he had an idea what it might be. There was only one way to test his idea and see if he was right. He stepped into the cupboard, pulled Gurk after him, and let the door swung shut. Now they were trapped inside the cupboard. In each of the four gleaming walls, Tim could see himself reflect again and again, back and forth, surrounding him with infinity versions of himself and Gurk. Gurk did appear to be interested in the mirrors and definitely disliked the sensation of being trapped. His tail dropped, his ears flattened, and he the back up on the back of his head. He looked at him with a mournful expression which seemed to say something like, Can you get out of here? In a minute, said Tim. First, I have to try something. If it doesn't work, then we can't get out of here. Gurk tail dropped even further. Tim pressed the arm uppermost button the blue one nothing happened he pressed the blue button again and still nothing happened he pressed the lower button the red one immediately his stomach lurched gurg wind in terror the metal copper was moving downwards as tim was suspected they were standing in a middle lift in plunk down 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 towards the center of the earth the end of chapter 31 Chapter 32 The leaf stopped suddenly. The door slid open. Tim walked out. Gurk hurried after him. They found themselves standing in a long, empty corridor lit with a strange yellowish glow. They must have been deep underground, but the air was cool and fresh. There was a curious humming sound which didn't seem to come from any particular direction. Gurk lifted his nose into the air and sniffed. He could smell something strange, something unexpected. The hair of, on his head, neck fluttered and he uttered a low, ominous growl. Tim looked down at Gurk. What's wrong? Gurk growled once more, then lifted his head and looked at Tim with unhappy eyes. He didn't like this place. He seemed to be sick. He wanted to get out of here right now. Tim whispered, what is it? What's wrong? In response, Gurk took a couple of steps toward the lift, then looked back at him. Let's go. He seemed to be saying, let's get back in the lift and escape from here. This isn't a good place. I don't like it either, whispered Tim, but we've come all this way. We can't leave now. Come on, Gurk, this way. He took a few paces down the corridor, then stopped and looked back. Gurk had followed him. Come on, his team, tugging the lead. Let's go! Reluctantly, Gurk trotted after Tim. Together, they walked down the long, wide corridor. Tim went ahead. Gurk followed a few paces behind, his ears flat against the back of his head, his whole body expressing anxiety. Tim had never seen Gurk look so frightened. In fact, Tim couldn't remember ever having seen Gurk looking frightened at all. Hungry, yes. Tired, yes. Cross, yes. But frightened? No. Fear was not an emotion that Gurk allowed himself to feel. And so Tim couldn't help feeling a little bit frightened too. Just as he couldn't help wondering what Gurk could sense or smell that caused him to feel such fear. At the end of the corridor, there was a steel door with two buttons, a red one and a blue one. Tim pressed the red button and the door slipped open. Evidently, a strong smell wafted through the air, something like a mixture between sweat and rotten vegetables. It reminded Tim of a place that he had visited re- recently, but he couldn't think where. The, t- the door slid shut behind them. The, they were standing on a narrow steel platform. Ahead, there was a handrail at about the height, height of Tim's chest. To the left and right, the platform ran around the length of the wall. Tim took a few steps forward, leaned on the handrail, and looked down. Gurk shuffled after him. The platform was high above the ground. To his amazement, Tim realized that they must be inside a enormous cave. 
carved from the heart of the island. Overhead, specks of water dribbled through cracks in the bare in the bare rock and dropped fifty meters to the floor below. A network of steel walkways and staircases crisscrossed the cavern. At regular in- intervals along the walls, there were dark entrances. Some bare. Bars aided by bars, and others blocked by solid steel doors. Down on the ground, Tink could see strange assemblies of complex material, covered with levers and tubes. There was a small crane and a row of electronic microscopes, and the type of operating table that you might find in a doctor's surgery. Twenty computers squatted on low tables. A towel. Of cages held about a hundred white mice. There was no natural light or v- ventilation. Fluorescent bulbs provided a pale yellowish glow, glow which made everything, even Tim's skin and Gert's fur, look curiously artificial. Now Tim understood the source of the continuous humming that he could hear. That must be the sound of air conditioning. Pumping fresh air from the surface onto this contained space, the smell seemed strong enough, but Tim still couldn't remember where he had smelled it before. Tim couldn't see any people or even signs of life, of life, but the cavern was full of particular sounds, groans and yells, mewling and moaning, a kind of growl, and the sounds of exotic birds, as if someone had. Recover, recorded the sounds of a kennel and a caddy at a forest and a jungle, and w- was now playing the soundtrack over and over again, mingling all the noises of different animals together. Tim couldn't begin to imagine how much time, effort, and money must have been spent to create this place, but he couldn't even really imagine why the island's owner would have done so. Nowhere else to the entire planet could possibly be so private. Buried underground on a private island, hidden from intruders and prying eyes, the carving would be entirely secret. Even spy plans or satellites wouldn't be able to see what was happening here. If you wanted to do something completely confidential and perhaps illegal, then you couldn't create a better environment than this. Gurk barked twice loudly. Shh, his team, but Gurk took no notice. His tail was wagging and his ears had perked up. He barked again twice more louder. From the other side of the caravan, an answering bark came back. For a moment, Tim assumed that the bark must have been just an echo of Gurk's, bouncing back from the opposite wall. But then it was joined by another and another and another. Each bark different from the others, not quite the same as Gurk's. Somewhere in this enormous curve. Cavern, hide, hidden down a corridor or roaming along the walkways, there must be some ducks, guard ducks, certain furious guard dogs with strong jaws and sharp teeth. They will run along these still walkways and rip us to pieces. He will look around, searching for an escape route, trying to decide which way to tur- which way to run, to the left and the right. The what. Wa- Way look exactly the same running alongside the bare rock. Before Tim could decide whether to run to the left or the right, the noise of barking was joined by other stranger noises. The roars and groans of twenty different animals jumbled together, swelling out of the caravan and echoing around the vast rocky roof. Tim gasped. That the noise must be playing through loudspeakers. Perhaps it was designed to scare intruders. Perhaps someone was making a film, or perhaps. And then, as Tim tried to think of further explanations, he suddenly realized where he had smelled the dis- distinctive stings that pre- pervaded the air last December during the dual period between. Christmas and New Year, his parents had made, taken him to London Zoo. Before Tim could begin to imagine why or how the carving smelled like a zoo, he saw two men emerging 
from a doorway. They strolled along the caravan's floor. They were wearing khaki ki- ki- uniforms and black boots. They had machine guns slung over their shoulders. Tim kept very still, knowing that any sudden movement might attack attract their attention, but if they didn't look up, they wouldn't see him. On the opposite side of the cavern, a door slid open and two more men emerged. Rather than uniforms, these two were wearing long white coats. From here, high above them, Tim couldn't see their faces, but they might have been the scientists that he had seen earlier. Down in the middle of the cavern's cavern's floor, the four men met and talked. None of them looked upwards at the steel walkways running round the top of the cavern. None of them noticed a small boy locking in the middle of the highest walkway, leaning on the handrail, standing very still, hoping not to be seen. The four men talked for a couple of minutes. Around them, the noise of angry, terrified animals, milling, groaning, gibbering, moaning, gradually sub- subsided. Until the cavern was so quiet that Tim could almost distinguish the actual words that the four men were speaking. The guards continued walking. The scientists sat at separate tables and started working on computers. Tim watched them for a moment. Then Todd Gurk slid. This way, he whispered. His voice was his voice so quiet that he couldn't even hear himself. Kirk stared at him, making no secret of his reluctance. His ears were flattered against his skull, and his air, his tail was down. He didn't like this place. He didn't want to stay here another second. He would have preferred to walk back down the corridor to the lift and return to the surface, but he didn't have any choice. One end of the lid was tied to his collar and the other was in Tim's hand. Slowly, Gurk padded after Tim. Together, the boy and the dog headed along the metal walkway. The end of chapter 30, 32. Chapter 33. Tim tried to walk quickly. He knew that if his footsteps were sounded against the metal walkway, the guards or the scientists might hear him. He tiptoed down the flight of stairs, followed by Gurk, and continued along the next walkway. Every few paces, he passed another doorway. He glanced into each one and saw a variety of different rooms. Most were empty. A few contained the sort of equipment that you might see in a doctor's or dentist's surgery, forks, forks, clamps, drills, drips, operating tables, and syringe. Others contain upper tubes that look unlike anything the team had ever seen before. Tim could imagine what happened in this cavern. He couldn't make a sense of all this all the different things that he had seen. As he passed the tenth or twelfth doorway, he glanced inside and saw a sight so surprising that he stopped, unable to take another step. The doorway was blocked by a mesh of strong, slim metal bars. On the other side, there was a cave carved out of the rock, making a cell that was probably no bigger than your kitchen and perhaps a little smaller. Instead, Inside the cell, there was a tiger. The tiger was so still that Tim thought it might be made of plastic. Then he realized that the tiger's chest was rising and falling with each slow, steady breath. The tiger was made of pr- plastic. She was just utterly depressed. Tigers need space. They are f- ferocious, energetic energy animals which roam for miles from the jungle searching for food. But this particular tiger had been confined to a small cave for a long, long time and lost her love of life. Confinement had sapped her an energy and fursoity. Her eyes were dull and watery. Full had 
fallen from fur had fallen from her body, leaving patches of bald skin. The tiger lay on the ground, unable even to rouse enough strength to lift her head and peer at the body and the dog lingering outside her cell. Tim and Gurg stared at the tiger for a couple of minutes, then continued along the walkway. In the next cell, they saw a goat lying on a patch of straw, man. Ching slowly and contentedly. In the cell after that, the saucery monkey slumped on the floor like an old man exhausted by a heavy meal. The following three cells contain a ship, several rabbits, and a giant tortoise, just like the one that Tim has seen on the surface. Now, Tim understood the source of the smell. The carpet smelled like a zoo because it was a zoo. But why would Edward Goliath keep a zoo down here? Why would he confine his animals to small cells far underground rather than letting them roam on the island's surface? Tim and Gurr continued walking. In the next cell, they found a creature that Tim had never expected to see in the zoo. Behind the bars, there was a man. Just like the other animals in the zoo, the man was sitting on the floor of an empty cage. He looked thin and weak. He had straggly white hair which hung about his face. He was wearing fatty blue jeans and a white shirt. His feet were bare. The man lifted his head and stared at him. In his bloodshot eyes, there was an expression of or overwhelming boredom and despair. Tim stared back for a second, then hurried onwards, unable to meet the man's eyes for more than a second. As he continued along the walkway, he wondered whether he should go back again and do something, talk to the man perhaps, or try to free him. But he couldn't bring himself to turn around. He didn't want to look into those eyes again. Gurg was right. This was a bad place. Whatever was happening here, Tim didn't like it. He hurried past more salt. It was barricaded by steel bars. Each contained a human being. There were three men and one woman. All of them seemed terrified of Tim. The woman co- covered her head with both hands on as if she was trying to protect herself from a punch. The man shuffled backwards, putting as much distance as possible between themselves and the doorway. None of them even attempted to speak. The next cell held something that Tim had never seen before and never even imagined in his most horrible nightmares. A creature that was neither human or tortoise, but a bit of both. It was giant tortoise with a human hand growing from the top of its shell, the fingers lifting upwards as if they were reaching for the sky. Tim and Gurk stood outside the cell and stared through the bars. The tortoise stared back. It opened its mouth and made a low mourning nose noise. Tim couldn't look. He turned his head away and walked along the line of cells. In the final cell before the staircase, there was a tortoise with three ears grafted into its shell. Human ears. Three human ears certainly attached to the shell of a giant tortoise. Tim felt sick. He had never seen anything so disgusting. He tried to imagine what kind of person might do, might do this, and just as importantly, why they would possibly want to do this, but he couldn't. It was beyond the powers of his imagination. He looked down at Gert. Gert looked up at, up at him with small frightened eyes. You're right to be scared, said Tim. I'm scared too. Now he wished that he'd take more notice of Gurk. Gurk had tried to escape from this place, not wishing to spend a single second longer here than he had to. As always, Gurk had been right. It would have been better to leave this place immediately. Tim looked around, took Gurk's lead, and hurried back the way that they had come. Gurk trotted alongside him, pleased to be leaving. They walked past the tor- tortoise and the humans and the horrific creatures that were both tortoise and human and climbed the stairs up to the next level. And they, and then they stopped. Two men were coming towards them. Two men wearing khaki uniforms and carrying machine guns. For a moment, 
The four of them, the guards and the boy and the dog, stared at one another, too surprised to move or speak. Then one of the men shouted and the other raised his gun. Tim and girls turned and ba ran back down the stairs. They sprinted along the walkway, reached another line of stairs, and ran down those two. They were on the lowest level. They ran across the floor, heading for the other side. Tim barely had time to register what he was running past. He noticed a bank of computers, a tray of gleaming medical in implements and some kind of enormous table covered with stars and tubes. On the other side of the cavern, there were two brightly lit corridors leading into the rock. Tim wavered for a moment trying to decide whether to get to go left or right. Before he could make a decision, a guard stepped out of each corridor. Tim turned around. From the other way, more guards were approaching. There was no escape. The guards around the team and girl. One spoke into a two way radio. Another st stopped forward and shouted in a language that Tim couldn't understand. It's, I'm terribly sorry, said Tim, but I've got no idea what you're saying. Do you speak English? <laughs> in strongly accent English, the guard said, you put your hands in the air right now. Very slowly, Tim raised his hands into the air. The end of chapter 73. Chapter 34 For several hours, Mr. and Mrs. Smolt had not exchanged a single word. They could have been talking to one another. They were both on the same beach. There was no one else available for conversation. But Mrs. Smolt had been sitting by the sea and Mr. Smolt had been standing by the trees and not a word had passed between them. Mr. Malt had not been idle. In fact, he'd been working extremely hard. He had paced along the line of the trees, searching for the perfect spot. He wanted somewhere sh sheltered from the wind and shadowed from the sun. Yet, with the sight of the sea, he soon found an ideal clearing between two tall palms. He walked around the site, inspecting it from every angle that re traded a few pieces down the beach and stood with his arms folded over his chest, picturing exactly what he wanted to build. When he had a firm vision in his mind, he hurried into the woods and hunted through the trees, gathering branches, twigs, and leaves. When Mr. Malt finished building his shelter, just before sunset, he walked down the beach beach. He found his wife sitting on the sand, staring at the sea. She had her head in her hands. Hello, said Mr. Mold. His wife did not reply. Mr. Mold spread his arms to encompass the view, the rusty sky, and leisure waves. The wife said, the palm trees, he said, isn't this lovely? Mrs. Mold still didn't respond. She didn't even move. Her hands stayed resolutely clasped in her hands. Mr. Mal said, Melanie, there was no response. Mr. Mal said, are you alright? There was still no response. Mr. Mal said, we should probably start thinking about supper. Finally, Mrs. Mal left her head, turned and looked at her husband. Supper, she said in a low voice. Oh yes, supper. So what shall we have for supper? A nice steak? Some roast chicken? Or how about another plate of that delicious foie gras? We've got three boiled eggs, said Mr. Malt. That's one of one and a half each, plus an apple and a cucumber. Terrific, said Mrs. Malt. When you were having your jolly holidays in Devon, I don't suppose you learned how to catch a fish? No, but I have managed to find some fruit which looks rather interesting. It is growing on a tree in the jungle. The only thing was I have no idea if it's poisonous. Why don't you try some, said Mrs. Malt. If you're still alive in a week, we'll know it's not poisonous. Mr. Malt sighed. You seem to be angry, be, a bit angry with me. He said, I don't think that's entirely fair. Angry? Really? I'm so sorry if I seem angry, but I'm not ex exactly having the best holiday of my life. Nor am I, but that's no reason to be angry with me. It's not my fault. Terrence, who stole the boat? Tim did. And who taught him to drive a boat? 
That's not fair," said Mr. Malt. "You can't blame me for what Tim did. I can't blame you," said Mrs. Malt, "and I do." With that, she turned her back on her husband and returned to staring at the ocean. Mr. Malt looked at. The back of his wife's head for a few moments. Then he sighed. He were ma- there were many things that he could have said, but he thought it was probably wisest to say none of them. He slouched slowly back up the beach. As he walked, he gathered a couple of branches. They would do very well for the doorway. Halfway up the beach, he stopped for a moment and complimented his shelter. Although he said no, he said so himself. It looked entirely professional. Not many castaways could have built himself such good shelters on their first night. He was very pleased with his own skill and ingenuity. He remembered the books that he had read as a boy: Robinson Crusoe, Venice, Treasure Island, Swallows and Amazons. He remembered all the different heroes that he had admired so much: Peter and Bevis, Bevis and Jim, and Robinson himself. Did any of them have to cope with a depressed wife? No, they did not. They had troubles of their own. Of course, no one would deny that. They had to struggle against pirates and hunger and storms. Even so, he would have liked to see how Peter, Bevis, Be- Be- Jim, or Robinson dealt with Melanie Malt. When Mister Malt reached his shelter, he propped the two branches in the doorway, just as he had hoped. They filled up perfectly. Mr. Malt sat in the doorway of his shelter and carefully spread his spare of the remaining food. He halved the apple, the cucumber, and one of the eggs. He ate his halves, putting a reminder aside for Melanie. He knew what she was like. She might be grumpy now, but she would get hungry later. As he ate, he tried to savor every mouthful, knowing that he might not eat again for several hours or even days. When he had eaten, he went for a pee among the trees, then walked down to the sea and washed the wash his hands, face, and feet. He glanced along the beach. His wife was sitting exactly where he had left her. He didn't disturb her. He walked back up the beach, undressed, and climbed inside the shelter. The blanket of palm trees was surprisingly comfortable. Mister Mole stretched out. A few minutes later, he was asleep. In the middle of the night, Mister Mole was woken by a strange rustling. He had vis- visions of passers searching for a midnight feast. He imagined lizard gobbling his feet. And then he realized that Mrs. Malt had crawled into a shelter beside him. Mr. Malt sat up and rubbed his eyes. In a brilliant voice, he said, "Are you hungry? Do you want the other egg?" Without a word, Mrs. Malt lay down and turned her back on her husband. Mr. Malt stared through the gloom at his wife's back. He would have liked to say something, but he couldn't think of anything to say. So he lay down and closed his eyes. The end of chapter thirty four. Chapter thirty five. At the entrance of the Turner, there was a ra- railway wagon with eight small wheels sitting on a pair of metal tracks. The guards ushered Tim into the wagon. He sat on wa- one of the slim wa- wooden benches. Gert lay on the floor at his feet. A guard sat on either side of Tim. Another two sat opposite. The fifth pressed a button. The wagon sh- shuddered forward, then st- started speeding along the tracks. It went surprisingly fast. The breeze whooshed through the air, through their hair. The turner ran from the caravan to the surface. When the builders had been is- excavating the car- cavern, they used these tracks to remove deeper. Debris. Once the caravan was built, the tracks carried cages, computers, and animals into the laboratories. They had been moving for a couple of minutes when, up ahead, a pair of doors swung open automatically. The tracks ran out of the tunnel and continued down the length of the gay quay. Then, a switch clicked and a wagon rolled to a halt.
Emerging from the dim lit tunnel into the bright sunshine, him and the guards shaded their eyes, blinking at the sudden contrast. Girl strained at the lid, eager to jump out of the wagon, wanting to sniff the sea and the salt and the fish and the sweet and all the other interesting smells clamoring to be smelt. The wagon had come to a halt at the edge of a small harbor. Edward Goliath owned several booths which were marooned against the quays. Six powerful speedboats, a pair of small yachts, and a massive white cruiser. Tink could read the name written in flowing black black letters on the hull the fountain of yes tim hardly hardly had time to admire the beautiful boots their polished dust gleaming in the sunlight before he was hurried towards a stairway cut into the rock leading for from the harbor to the house on the cliff two guards walked ahead of him and two more behind at the top of the stairway the guards assured him and Gurg along the gravel path. Heavily set plant flowers filled the air with smells, sweet smells. Oranges, lemons, and mangoes hung from trees. They passed a long swimming pool and two tennis courts before reaching the house. Several more guards were waiting. All of them were dressed in the same way, wearing khaki uniforms, black boots, and peaked caps. They led him into the house. It was a luxurious mansion which felt more like a hotel than a home. Vases of fresh flowers rested on polished wooden tables. Large abstract paintings graced the walls. They walked down several corridors, then came to a door. A guard knocked twice and said something in a language that Tim could understand. Then there was a an answering shout in English, send him in. The guard opened the door and pushed him inside. Girl scrambled after him. The door swung shut behind them and closed with an almost in enabled click. Tim found himself standing at the end of the long high sealed room with big windows overlooking the ocean. This could have been a dining room or a meeting room. There was a long wooden table surrounded by 20 chairs. <laughs> Down at the end of the table, a single place was laid for dinner. A small, a tall, handsome man was walking towards him. He had a strong chin and thin skin. He was wearing sorts of trainers and a bright blue shirt. Aha, he said, clapping his hands together astonishingly. So you're the little transparent. Trespasser, is that right? I suppose I may be, said Tim. That the man smelled, showing two lines of white, gleaming perfect teeth. Welcome to Calypso, he said. My name is Edward Golias. He spread his arms wide to encompass the room. This is my house. In fact, this is my island. Golias took a look, long look at the boy who was standing before him. And what's your name? Tim. Just Tim? Or do you have another name too? Malt, my name is, is Timothy Malt. Hello, Timothy Malt, said Goliath. He looked at the dog standing by Tim's feet. And this is Gurk, said Tim. Hearing his name, Gurk wagged his tail and barked twice. Goliath said, so Tim, you and your dog have caused me a certain amount of trouble. Do you know that? Tim said, I suppose so. Really tell me what you're doing here and why you crashed a boot on my island? I came to see what happened to Monster X. Monster X, who might he be? The man who was washed up on the beach, said Tim. Goliath nodded. Ah, yes, that man. Now, I understand. You are the little boy who found him. Are you? Yes, said Tim. And you think he has some connection to this island? I know he did, said Tim. You know he did? Do you? And how exactly do you know that? Tim didn't exactly know very much at all, but he had guessed what had happened to Monster X, and he was almost certain that his guesswork was correct. You kept him prisoner, but he escaped. He was so desperate to get away, he threw him himself into the sea and tried to swim away, but he couldn't swim all the way to Mehe. He was half dead by the time he got there. You're a clever boy, said Goliath, putting his hand on Tim's shoulder. Come over here, sit down. You and I should have a little chat. 
They walked to the table Golia sat at the head, where a single place had been laid for dinner. Sit down here, said Golia, gesturing at the place beside him, the one without plates or cutlery. Tim sat down, Gurk sniffed the table's leg a few times and lay down at Tim's feet. Tim was hungry, so he was pleased to see that there wasn't any food on the table. It might have been unbearable to stare at the food that he couldn't eat. Beside Goliath's place, a place was set for one person. There was chunky silver cutlery, an elegant white plate, the several little silver pots for salt, pepper, mustard, and re relish. Golia says, will you have a drink? Yes, please. What would you like? I don't mind. I'm having mango juice. What would you like? What would you like that too? That sounds fine, thanks. Tea mango juice coming right up. Golia smiled and walked to the end of the room, where a large drinks cabinet stood against the wall. He took two glasses and poured the drinks. Tim stared at the knives and forks beside Golia's plate. Perhaps I should steal one, he saw. A knife would allow me to protect myself. Then he realized that the idea was ridiculous. Golia noticed immediately that a knife was missing. He would call the guards from outside and they would disturb teams without a struggle. A little boy, even a little boy armed with a knife, couldn't possibly fight guards armed with machine guns. Nevertheless, stealing something seemed like a good idea. It might be useful later. Tim stretched forward and gray grabbed the pepper pot. Just as T was stuff stuffing the pepper pot into his pocket, Goliath turned around, carrying two glasses. Tim worried that he might have been seen, but Goliath didn't say anything. He ha carried the drinks to the table. Cheers, said Goliath. Cheers. They clanked glasses and drank. Goliath leaned back in his chair. He said, Tell me something, Tim. Are you good at general? Are you good at general knowledge? Quite, said Tim. Then let me ask you a question, said Goliath, leaning back in his chair. An intelligent boy like you should know the answer. What creature on the planet lives the longest? Tim shrugged his shoulders. He didn't have a clue. Humans, he guessed? No, no, no. Guess again. Elephants? No. Snakes? Goliath shook his head. The answer, as an intelligent boy like yourself, should be half new, is the giant tortoise. Well, a few fish have lived even longer, but who cares about fish? Tim was just about to answer the question of fisherman. He was going to say, Oh, fishmongers, not to mention people who go scuba diving. But before he had a chance to speak, Goliath picked up the thread of what he had been saying. The giant tortoise said, Goliath is a rare and ex externally creature which is found only in a few islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Most giant tortoises live 150 years. Some live much longer. The oldest record giant tortoises live for almost 300 years. Three whole centuries. I'll tell you a secret, Tim. I am determined to live that long too. Tim remember what he said in the cavern. So you've been experimenting on them? On them, yes, and their eggs, and a few other creatures too. It's been most interesting. My scientists have been feeding some creatures on a diet of tortoise eggs and other untortoise meat. They have been injecting monkeys with tortoise blood. They have transplanted a tortoise leg into a rabbit and put the brain on a tortoise inside the head of a baboon. I can tell you, young man, the results have been fascinating. Every day, with the help of these animals, we are coming a little closer to the secret of entire life. Tim said, and uh, what about experimenting on humans? Ah, uh, said Goliath, you've seen my little collection, your collection? What have you done to those people? Exactly what I've done to the rabbits, the monkeys, the goats, and the rats. Some of them have been injected with tortoise blood. Others eat a diet of tortoise eggs, and a few have helped with more surgical experiments, daunting an ear or a kidney. 
That's disgusting, Tan said Tim. No, no, it's not disgusting. It's just science. These creatures and these people are helping my scientists in their quest to discover the secret of internal life. One or two people may have to suffer, but the whole of humanity will evenly benefit. Tim said, "You can't just experiment on people." Why not? Because it's horrible, said Tim, and it must be against the law. I suppose you're probably right, said Goliath. But I am the I am one of the richest men on the planet. Such pretty restrictions do not concern me. Laws are for poor. No, they're not, said Tim. Laws are for everyone. You're very young," said Goliath. "You don't know much about life. Let me tell you how the world works. The rich make the laws, and the poor obey them." Tim shook his head. "I know enough about the world to know you shouldn't be keeping people underground in a secret laboratory. I know you shouldn't be experimenting on them. I know you can expect to." Midway through the sentence, Tim paused, struck by a sudden fright, frightening thought. He said, "What?" Why are you telling me all this? How are you going to stop me telling the whole world that you're, you've done here? Are you going to kill me? Goliath shook his head. No, no, I won't kill you. Not at all. I'm going to co- do the complete opposite. What do you mean? You, will you let me go? Of course not, said Goliath. I'm going to make you live forever. How? What did you do to me? You will join my collection. My scientists will learn a lot from you. At the moment, I have some middle-aged men and women and a few old ones, but no children. A small boy like yourself will be very useful. You can't do that," said Tim, appalled by the idea of being taken back to the caravan and convinced to one of the cells. Once he was there, he was sure he would never escape. You have to let me go. I don't have to do. I. Don't have to do anything," said Goliath. "This is my island. This is my kingdom. Here, I can do whatever I like." Tim clenched at his fist. He felt furious and terrified, and worst of all, completely helpless. He said, "My parents will come looking for me, and the police too, and they'll find you," said Goliath. "Or rather, they'll find the remains." Off your boat, twenty miles from here, smashed on a rock at this moment. My men are removing your boat from the bench and putting it into a helicopter. They'll deliver it to another island and drop it into the sea. The police are very efficient. They'll find it quickly and they'll know exactly what happened. Another stupid tourist drove his boat into a rock and drowned. They won't find your body, but they won't be. Any great surprise? The Indian Ocean is a vast expanse of water. They will simply assume that you were swept away by the currents and taken to the other side of the world. Tim stared at Goliath, speechless with horror. There was nothing he could say. With a calm, self-satisfied smile, Goliath picked up the silver bell and rang it. Immediately, the door opened and a guard came into the room. Sir. Could you take this young man to his cell, please? Yes, sir. The guard nodded. Tim stared at Goliath in a quiet voice. He said, "You won't get anyway with this." Oh, I will," replied Goliath. That's one of the benefits of being extremely rich. When you have as much money as me, you always get away with everything. He nodded to the guard. Take him away. The end of chapter thirty-five. Chapter thirty-six. Four guards led Tim back along the way that he had come, marching down the stairs to the harbor and entering the underground complex. Tim was careful to catch his surroundings. He, if he ever got a chance to escape, he wanted to know where to go and how to find his way out. They walked through the laboratory. The guards were vigilant vill- and alert, watching Tim constantly, never giving him a chance to run away. Before he took two pieces, they would catch him or shoot him. At the end of the brightly lit corridor, they reached a steel door with two buttons on the outside, a red one and a blue one. One of the guards pressed the red button. The door slid open. The other guard pushed Tim inside. Tim stumbled into the cell. It was empty, apart from a metal bucket and a white jig. White jug. The guard drew his leg back and kicked Greek. With a sharp squeak, Greek flew through the door and sped across the floor. 
The guard pressed the blue button and the door slid, slid shut. Tink could hear the footsteps of the guards fading into the distance, and then there, were, there was silence. Tink knew exactly what she wanted. A hot bath, followed by a glass of cold orange juice with lots of ice, followed by a cheese and tomato sandwich, followed by a long snooze in his own bed. But you can't always have what you want. Sometimes you have to be satisfied with what you've got. And this is what Tim had got. A jug of lukewarm water and a concert floor in a damp, damp cell. He checked his pockets, hoping he might find a piece of chewing gum or some peanuts. But he found nothing except a pepper pot. He was distressed by his own foolishness. Why had he stolen a pepper pot? Why did I have... He had the good sense to steal something useful, a sandwich, for instance, or a chicken leg. If only he'd grabbed the remnants of the picnic before abandoning his parents, he wouldn't be so hungry now. He thought about the, his parents for a moment, wondering what might have happened to them. Even without a boat, he was sure that they had some had found some way to get off the island and return to the hotel seashell. By now, they'd be sitting in the hotel research, restaurant, tucking into a nice big supper, then heading for a long night's sleep in their comfortable beds. Not like me, Sotin, I don't have supper or a bed. He drank several long glugs of water, then poured some into his cupped hand so Gert could have a drink too. Kurt laid himself all over, then walked three times in a circle and lay down. He closed his eyes and appeared to fall asleep immediately. Tim lay down using his own arm as a pillow, but he couldn't relax. Too many thoughts reeled through his head. He saw flashes of sights that he had seen earlier in the day, images from the island and the cavern. He remembered the creatures that he had seen confused in other cells, the tiger and the monkeys, the frightened looking people, the tortoise with a human hand grabbed onto the top of his shell. He heard the voice of Monica X, desperately whispering help them. Now, finally, he understood what Monica X had meant. He knew who had to be helped. Tim set up, he couldn't sleep. Not now. He had to find a way to get out of here. If Monica X had escaped from the island, he could too. For the first time, he took a proper look at his surroundings. He was convinced to a long, thin cell without any furniture or windows. The only light came from a yellowish bulb abandoned into the cell. He paced around the cell, inspecting every inch of the floor and the wall, hoping to find a loose paving stone or a hidden exit. Although he couldn't find either of those, he did discover one interesting thing. There was some markings scratched into the wall. He knelt down to inspect them more closely. The scratches, lo the scratches looked like letters, but he couldn't make out what they spelled. He lay on the floor and ran his fingers along the wall. All of the scratches, he realized, made the same patterns. Six upper slashes, then a seventh horizontal slash across the middle. Immediately, Tim understood the sinus face of these marks. Each scratch represented a day. Each collection of seven scratches represented a week. Altogether, these scratches showed how long the cell's previous accountant had stayed in here. Had Monster X been here? Had, had these markings been made by Sin when he was locked in the cell? And if so, how did he manage to escape? If Tim had wanted to disprise himself even further, he could have continued up all the scratches and discovered how long he might expect to remain in this, in this cell. But he didn't want to know that. Just by looking at the wall, he could tell already that there were hundreds of scratches, if not thousands, re representing the weeks, months, and years of a man's life. 
a life that had been wasted with some these four walls. Turning his back on the scratches, Tim sat on the floor and looked at Girk. He whispered, What are we going to do? Girk lifted his head and looked at him. Then he put his head down again, closed his eyes, and went back to sleep. Tim whispered, How can you sleep at a time like this? This time, Girk didn't even lift his head. He opened one eye, glanced at Tim for a moment, then closed his eyes again and went back to sleep. Tim said, sometimes he whispered that Gurk was a more sensible dog. Didn't he understand the urgency of their situation? Didn't he realize that they had to try and escape? Didn't he know that if he, if they didn't find a way out of the cell and this cavern, they would have to spend the rest of their lives down here, being used by Edward Golia scientists in their quest to discover the secret of internal life? And then Tim realized that Gurk was being entirely sensible, much more sensible, in fact, than himself. They were trapped in a small cell. The door was made of steel. The, wall, the walls were solid rock. There was no way out, and so there was no point even worrying about how to escape. They shouldn't squander their energy on panic. They shouldn't waste their time getting upset upset or trying to sink their way out of an impossible situation. Just as Gurg was doing, they should sleep now and conserve their strength for tomorrow. Tim nodded. As usual, Gurg was right about everything. Tim lay down on the concert floor. He whispered, Good night. In response, Gurg's tail thumped on the hard concert floor. Then they both tried to sleep. The end of chapter 36. Chapter 37. At dusk, the blue boat chugged around the coast, heading for the jetty. Max had his hands clasped on the wheel, steering the boat through the waves. Next to him stood Bish, his cigar clamped between his teeth, singing along of the songs of, on the radio. Natchesa was slumped in the back of the boat, flicking through the pages of a book filled with colorful photographs. Percy was sitting beside her, peering at the ocean through the binoculars. It had been a long day. They were tired and hungry and very much looking forward to getting back to the hotel. Natchesa wanted to long wanted a long bath. Filled with bubbles, followed by a quiet evening with her notebooks, writing vivid description of all the external visions that she had seen at the bottom of the sea. Max wanted to wanted a large stack on lots of chips. That afternoon, Bish had given them another lesson in diving techniques. In the afternoon, Max and Natasha had plung off the boat, swam along a coral reef. reef they ate a shoal of golden snappers, spotted a mortally ill, touched an octopus, and seen a hundred bewildering creatures more colorful than anything they had believed possible. Now, Natchesa was sitting in the back of Bish's blue boat, flicking through the pages of the big book of tropical fish, learning the names of all the different creatures that she had seen. Max was standing at the wheel, steering the boat, complete, completing, completing his first lesson in how to be a sea captain. As the blue boat rounded the final prom promontory and headed for the jetty, Beach looked puzzled. He stopped singing and muttered, muttered something under his breath. Max was wrong. Look, said Beach, she pointed at the jetty. Max stared at the dead jet. It looked completely normal. As far as he could tell, the thing had changed since this morning. I don't understand, he said. It's not like the same as when we left. That's exactly the problem, said Bish. What do you mean? What I mean is this. Where is, said Bish, where is my book? Hearing what he had said, Percy and Natchesa scrambled up to their feet and hurried down the cockpit to stand beside Bish and Max. All four of them stared at the jetty. Bish was right. The jetty was empty. There was no sign of the red boat. 
As soon as they reached the jetty, Max leaped from the boat and ran down to the shore, hoping to find some indication that the moths had been there, here, but there was nothing. It was getting dark. The moths should have returned hours ago. Peach has successfully su told them to leave Aubergine Island by mid-afternoon, giving themselves enough time to get home before nightfall. He didn't want them to be sailing the open sea in the dark. Percy threw the robe to Max. Tie that up, please. Max looped, looped the rope around one of the poles on the jetty. Now Chesa leaped off the boat and tied up another rope to the to another pole. When the boat was secure, Beach stepped onto the jetty and shook both their heads. It's been a good day, he said. Now, you two go back to the hotel. Who knows? They might be waiting for you there. Now, just as said, why would they be in the hotel? What about their boat? They might have gone to a different jetty, said Bish. Maybe they wanted to buy some souvenirs or watch the fishermen coming into harbor. Quite possibly, they're sitting on the terrace right now, drinking a delicious cocktail, wondering what's keeping you so long. Max said, and if they're not, then I'll see you at dawn, said Bish, and we'll stand out a search party. Nechesa said, can you go do that now? What if they are in trouble? Bish shook his head. There wasn't any point, he said. In a few minutes, the sun was set, sending a search party into the night would just lead to more problems and more people getting lost. They would have to wait till morning. Max and Nechesa hurried back to the hotel, hoping they would find Tim, Gert, and the Mots waiting in the lobby, snoozing in their rooms or sipping drinks on the terrace. But there was no sign of them. Miss Quiz, the receptionist in the lobby, she checked the board behind her desk and shook her head. Neither Tim or nor the Mulls had collected their keys. They had returned to the hotel. That night, Max and the Chesa waited as long as possible, hoping the Mulls would be back for supper. They got hungrier and hungrier, but they didn't want to eat alone. Max watched DVDs. Nechesa sat in the hotel library and did some research for a travel article about the Seychelles, reading books and magazines, talking lots, taking lots of notes. Eventually, they realized that the malts were coming back. They sat on the hotel terrace and shared a manicholi supper. Nechesa couldn't be bothered to scold Max for eating a steak. Max didn't have the energy to tease Nechesa for eating a soap. They just ate their supper, refused pudding, and went to bed, hoping that the morning would bring good news. The end of chapter 37. Chapter 38. Tim rolled over. His limbs aged. There was nothing very restful about spending a night slugging on a hard concert floor. He had no idea how much time had passed. It might have been immediately midday or midnight. The same pale yellowish glow illuminated the cell and the same strange smell wafted through the air. The door opened. Two guards came into the room. Tim realized that he must have been woken by the sound of their footsteps in the corridor. Get up, said one of the guards. Tim said, why? Get up, replied the guard, as if he hadn't even heard Tim's question. Slowly, reluctantly, Tim hauled himself to his feet. In a rush, he remembered the events of yesterday and what, what he had learned about Edward Goliath. He remembered that this morning was the first of many, many mornings that he was condemned to spend underground, convinced to this cavern. Unless he found a way to escape, he remembered the mournful expressions of the catch creatures on the other levels. With each day that they spent underground, they had now more lethargic and depressed. They had given up all thought of escape. They had lost hope. Whatever happened, he didn't want to become like them. The two guards ushered the team and guard into the corridor where three more guards were waiting. Tim was surprised. Did he really need five grown men to exert him? Would he would did they think he was James Bond? 
one of the guards gestured at the lid, which Tim was holding in his right hand. Give that to me, he said. Tim shook his head. No. Yes, give it to me. No, said Tim, you're not taking Gurk. You do what I say. Instead, the Gurk gave it to me. When Tim tried to protest, the guard gestured the two of his men. Then step forward, grabbed Tim's arms, and pried apart his fingers on his left right hand, forcing Tim to release the lid. Gurk curled his lips, showing his sharp right teeth, and turned his head from side to side, starting to bite any of the guards who came close. One of the guards snatched the lid and jerked it violently. Gurk yelped. His neck hurt. The guard jerked the lid again even harder and dragged Gurk down the corridor. Gurk tried to resist, but the guard was much stronger than him. Every few paces, Gurk turned his head looking back. He stared mournfully at him. This expression was disparate. What are they doing? He seemed to be saying. What are they taking me? Where are they taking me? Then Gurk was taken around the corner and led away. The four guards led him down the stairs to the ground door floor. One marched ahead and behind and one on another side, giving him no opportunity to escape. Andrew Goldias was taking talking to a group of scientists in white coats. Seeing him and the guards, Goliath stepped forward to greet them. Good morning, young man. He said, did you sleep well in your new home? No, said Tim. I can't sleep well on concert concrete. You soon get used to it. Goliath turned to face his scientists. This young man was volunteered to join our team. He has given his body to scientists. Science. Later today, when I finished showing him around our fa facilities, I'd like you to take all his measurements in prepare preparation for the first ex experiments. Thank you, gentlemen. The science knew that they had been dismissed. They hurried in different directions around the laboratory, returning to their work. Goliath turned his attention to Tim. Come with me, young man. Since this is your first day, I'm going to show you what we're doing here. Tim thought about protesting or refusing, but he realized that a thorough for a facilities might be useful. He would be able to look for a possible escape route. He nodded and followed Goliath. The four guards walked behind them, ready to pounce if Tim tried to run away. As they walked in around the caravan, Goliath provided a running commentary, commentary explaining the purpose of particular pieces of metro machinery and the roles of different people. They passed men and women hunched over microscopes and surrounded by hundreds of test tubes filled with red, brown, and black liquid. Goliath explained that they were checking how the growth and decay of blood cells could be showed or tested. Goliath was proud of the facilities and pleased to have the opportunity to show a guest around. Secrecy was so important that visitors were never allowed into the cavern. He even took Tim into the control room where screens showed image images from cameras all around the facility. A huge bank of buttons and levers around the guards of control every aspect of life in the cavern. By pressing a button, the temperature could be raised or lowered. The door of any particular cell could be opened or shut, and so on. There and everywhere else, Tim searched for opportunities to escape, but he couldn't see any. Cameras watched every corridor. Guards lurked beside every entrance and exit. They were all armed. If he tried to run, he wouldn't get more than five paces. At the far end of the caravan, a hundred mice lived in small cages. Each mouse was fed a different diet and regularly checked for signs of sickness or health. Some died almost immediately, while others lived two or three times longer than mice are expected to live. Near the mice, a giant tortoise was attached to an enormous machine, tears pursing its skin and shell, taking measurements all the time. Goliath said in an excited voice, You see, 
Here it is, the secret of life, just waiting to be discovered. As far as the Itabilish, this tourist is at least 210 years old, more than two centuries. Imagine that, young man. Together, Goliath's team, Goliath's team and the guards look at the tortoise. The tortoise lifts its head very slowly and turns to look at them. Its black eyes seem to have an expression of infinite sadness. We're not far off, said Goliath. Goliath, his voice still humming with the same excitement. A few years from now, a few months, even, and we'll have cracked it. We will know why people die. We will know why people live. We will know the answer to the most important question in the world. He leaned forward and stared at him. Tell me, young man, do you know the most important question that a human being can ask? No, said Tim. Think. What is the single most important question that you could ever ask? I don't know. Then guess. Go on. Guess. Tim shrugged his shoulders. What's for lunch? Very funny, said Goliath, although he didn't laugh. No, I'll tell you the most important question in the world. Goliath leaned forward and looked at him with a strange smile. The most important question in the world is this. Why must I die? When he had spoken those words, Gullias paused for a moment, waiting for a reaction, but none came. Tim just stared at him with a blank expression, trying to show none of his feelings. Gullias repeated the words again. Why must I die? Have you ever asked yourself the question? No, said Tim. Well, you're very young, said Gullias. Just wait a few years. As you get older, you will start to ask yourself that question. Why must I die? You will never stop asking it until the end of your life. Why must I die? It is a question that all human beings ask themselves. It is the question which makes us different from animals. Monkeys, dogs, dolphins, all of them are similar to humans in many ways. But none of them have the ability to ask themselves this question. It is the most important question in the world. For centuries, people have said those words. Why must I die? But even after the centuries, only one man has ever come close to finding an answer. And that one man is me. Goliath spread his arms wide to encompass everything that surrounded him. The tortoise, the mice, the scientists, and all the machines and computers and cells uh, that filled the enormous cavern. Here, I will discover the secret of life, said Goliath, his eyes glittering with a strange glow. I will conquer death, and then I will live forever. For the first time, Tim realized something rather worrying. Edward Goliath wasn't just immensely rich and unbelievably powerful, he was also completely mad. Tim said, you're completely mad. Every genius in history has been described as a madman, said Goliath. It's just one small burden that we have to bear. Maybe you're not a genius, said Tim. Maybe you're just completely mad. Ignoring what Tim has said, Goliath glanced at his watch. It's been fun talking to you, young man, but now I must go. I have a very important meeting in New York. If my schedule permits, I'll be back here in a month. I look forward to seeing you then. With a smile, Goliath turned his back on Tim and star- started marching away, followed by his bodyguards. Let me go, cried Tim. Goliath stopped and turned around. What did you say? Please, beg Tim, don't keep me here. Just let me go. I can't, said Goliath. Why not? Because you know, you now know much about me. I can't let you re- reveal what you've seen to anyone. The world won't understand what I'm trying to avenge here and... They will try to stop me. I'm sorry, young man, but you've seen too much. You'll have to stay here forever. I won't tell everyone, anyone, said Tim. I'm good at keeping secrets. Golia slowly shook his head. I really don't understand why you want to leave. You should be pleased to be here. Pleased, said Tim. What should I be pleased? By staying here and helping my scientists. See how much good you will do. See how you help your fellow humans. By giving your body to science, you will be de- benefiting the whole of humankind. That's a lie, said Tim. I won't be helping anyone except you.
Goldia's shook his head. You may say I'm selfish, but you're wrong, quite wrong. When my scientists discover the secret of entire life, I shall not keep it to myself. I shall make myself immortal, of course, but I shall allow everyone else to share the secret of immortality. Together, we will conquer death. All of us will live forever. Goliath's words hung on the air for a second. Then he turned his back on Tim and walked briskly, away followed by his bodyguards. Tim would have run after Goliath and continued begging for his freedom, but he wasn't quick enough. Before he had a chance to move, two guards grabbed his arms, one on each side, and marched him back to his cell. The end of chapter 38 Chapter 39 Gert didn't know what was happening. He wanted to struggle, but the guard was stronger than him. Whenever Gert tried to resist, Resist. The guard talked, talked, the lead hurting Gert's neck. Gert allowed himself to be led up the stairs and along the walkways. He turned his head from side to side, taking note of every interesting scent, always looking for an opportunity to escape. On the top level of the cavern, the guard led Gert along the walkway. They passed cell after cell, then finally reached an open doorway. The guard thrust the Gurk inside and threw the lid after him. Gurk scrambled into the sm small, dimly lit cell. The guard didn't bother removing Gurk's lid. He was worried that if he tried to do so, Gurk would have wheeled around and beaten his hand. He was quite right to be worried. That was exactly what Gurk would have done. The guard retreated from the cell and pressed one of the buttons on the wall outside. A mesh of steel bars slid across the entrance, looking Gurk inside the cell. The guard marched away, his boots wrapped against the steel walkway, growing fainter with every footstep. Then he was gone. Everything was quiet. Gurk ran round the cell, sniffing the walls, checking the boundaries of his new prison. It didn't take long. He was trapped inside a small, dark cell. He had a bowl of dirty water but no food. There was no blanket, no bed, and mostly no way out. Gurk stood in the middle of the cell, opened his mouth and howled. It was a mournful howl, a miserable howl, the type of howl that you would fill you with despair. I have heard people say that no sound on earth is as terrible as the cry of a lonely dog, and it's difficult to disagree with them. Gurk took a deep breath and was just about to howl again when he stopped. He turned his head to one side. His ears perked up. He could hear a noise. He wasn't sure what it was. He listened. Yes, there it was again, the same noise. It was the answering howl of another dog. And then, coming from the opposite direction, there was yet another howl. Gurg realized that the cells on either side were occupied by other dogs. He wasn't alone. He had companions. Gurg barked. The other dogs barked back again. They couldn't see one another, but they could hear one another and communicated by barking. The dogs ignored it in terror interrogated Gurk, asking the question that dog always asks of one another when they are first introduced. Gurk barked back, answering their questions and asking his own. When he heard what they had to repeat, he was driving half crazy with horror and terror. He ran around in circles, sniffing the walls of his cell all over again, hoping against hope that he might discover some way to escape, but he couldn't. There was no way out. If the other dogs were to be believed, Gurg was going to spend the rest of his life in here, never seeing the sun, never smelling fresh air, never running on the grass, never chasing a rabbit, never doing any of things which made a dog's life worth living. The prospect terrified Gurk. He whined and barked and howled, trying to attract Tim's attention, begging to be taken out of here, but the only response were the whines and barks and howls of the other dogs in neighboring cages. 
the end of chapter 39. Chapter 40 In the morning, Mr. and Mrs. Smolt had started arguing as soon as they woke up and hadn't yet found any reason to stop. They were sitting inside the shelter. It should have been a cool, calm environment. Large leaves shaded them from the piercing early morning sun. A breeze blew off the sea, but the air was hot and seemed to grow hotter with every passing minute. Patches of sweat spread across Mr. Mott's shirt. Tears of frustration trickled down Mrs. Mott's scarlet cheeks. There were, they were arguing about what to do today. Mr. Mott wanted to reforest the shelter, search the jungle for the source of clean drinking water, and collect some wood for a bonfire. Mrs. Mott wanted to be somewhere else. She didn't care how or where. She would have been happy to build a boat, attract the attention of a passing fisherman, or even swim. She just wanted to get out of the island. Like most married couples, Mr. and Mrs. Smolt were extremely good at arguing, particularly with one another. Mr. Smolt knew exactly what would upset his wife. Mrs. Smolt knew just how to influence her husband. But this morning's argument was unusually fierce and bitter. They weren't used to being so tired, so hungry, and so completely stuck on a tropical island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I'll tell you what's most irritating, irritating said Mrs. Malt. You're being so entirely illogical. Me? Illogical? Ha! Huh. I'm sorry, Melanie, but it's the truth. Building a boat just isn't an option. We'd be better, much better advised to sit tight, conserve our risk, risk, uh, resources, and wait to be rescued. But what if we are not rescued? We will be. But when? I don't know, said Mr. Mole. Today or tomorrow, perhaps the next day. I can't stay here for three days. It wouldn't be the end of the world. That's exactly what it would be, said Mrs. Moth. I need a bath. I need a cup of coffee. I need... She broke off in mid-sentence and listened for a moment. What's that? What's that? What's what? Shh! The both sat very still and listened. There was a noise like a distant lone in a neighbor's garden. The noise quickly got louder. Within a few seconds, whatever was making the noise seemed to be directly overhead. It's an, en it's an engine, said Mrs. Moss. Run, or they won't know we're here. Mrs. Moss said, how do you know it's an engine? But Mrs. Moll didn't bother replying. She was already scurrying through the doorway. Her elbow knocked one of the branches that held the shelter together. The stretcher wobbled. Mrs. Moll emerged from the shelter, knocking aside another branch and sprinted down the beach. Behind her, the shelter creaked and shuddered, leaves slid to the ground. Mr. Mold sprang to his feet and grabbed the roof. He was just in time to prevent the entire structure from collapsing. If he moved, the shelter would tremble to the ground. He stood there like a pillar, holding up his house with both hands. Mrs. Mold was just in time to see the helicopter soaring overhead, and speeding into distance. She stood on the beach, waving and shouting, but the pilot obviously hadn't spotted her. No, smiled Mrs. Mo. No, no, no. She stared in horror at the departing helicopter. It soared through the air, following the line of the beach, and curled round the island. Mrs. Mo sank to her knees on the sand. This is exactly what she'd been dreading. There one chance to be rescued, and they miss it. The helicopter would never come back. They would, trap be, would be trapped here for days, if not weeks. Then Mrs. Mold heard a noise. Someone was shouting. She turned her head to see who was making so much sound. Mrs. Mr. Mold was standing at the top of the beach, holding a huge palm leaf in each hand. He had ripped them from the roof of the shelter. It was collapsed, but he didn't seem to care. He was waving the leaves above his head and shouting at the top of his voice. Here, he shouted, we're over here, staring 
through the windscreen. The pilot glimpsed some movement down the beach. He couldn't see exactly what it was. He moved the controls and changed direction. The helicopter flew around the coast and came closer to investigate. There, he would definitely see something. It looked like a man with sleeves attached to both hands. The pilot steered the helicopter down towards the shore. As soon as the helicopter settled on the sand, four people jumped out, ducking to avoid the waters and ran across the beach to meet the moths. Max and the Chesa came first, following by Inspector Bandicat and Dr. White, who was carrying an icebox and a medical bag. The helicopter belonged to the police. Inspector Bendicat had insisted on leading the search party and asked Dr. Y to co accompany them in case the boats had suffered any kind of accident. Max and Natchesa took turns to hug Mr. and Mrs. Moult. When they had finished hugging, Dr. Y quickly checked Mi the Moult's house. He immediately realized that they were suffering from two specific elements dehydration and a quick temper. He reached into the icebox and pulled out a perfect cure. Take this, he said, handing each of them a bottle of water and a bar of chocolate. When the boss had each drunk half a bottle of water and eaten several squares of chocolate, they both asked the same question. Where's Tim? That's why we were going to ask you, said Max, Duchess, and said, and where's Kirk? We don't know, said Mr. Malt. Tim took the boat, said Mrs. Malt. Inspector Bandicat stared at him. I don't understand. Are you saying your own son desert you on this island? Mr. and Mrs. Malt glanced at one another. Neither, neither of them wanted to admit that Tim had done, but they knew they, that they must. Slowly, sadly, the Malts explained what had happened. Inspector Bandicat and Dr. White were astounded. They never heard of a 12-year-old boy stealing a boat and abandoning his parents on the island. What kind of boy would do that? Max and Nachesa were surprised at all. They knew Tim. They knew Gurk. They even had a pretty good idea why Tim and Gurk would have stolen the boat and where they would have gone. Calypso Island, said Max. We should go there now, said Natchesa, before it's too late. Before what's too late, said Mrs. Walt. Natchesa said, before the same thing happened to him and ha that happened to Monster X. Or he might have gone somewhere completely different, said Inspector Bandica. He might be trying to get back to Mehe. He might be drifting in the middle of the ocean. He might even be... Uh, elsewhere on this island. Natchesa shook her head. He'll have gone to Calypso. Something happened there. He wants to find out what. We have to go there right now, said Max, before they kill him, just like they killed Monster X. Inspector Bendica reminded that he was in command of the operation. The helicopter belonged to the his police force. They would do whatever he decided. And this is what he had decided. They would search a Albert Jane Island first, checking for signs of any human presence, then score the rocks for wreckage from the boat in case Tim had smashed himself against the shore. If they couldn't find any trace of him, Tim, Gurk, or the boat on Albert Jane Island, he perhaps they would fly to Calypso. Let's go, said Inspector Bendicat. We should start searching before the day gets any hotter. Max and Natchesa glanced at one another. They knew the inspector was making a mistake, but they also knew that there was no way to convince him of that fact. He was a responsible middle-aged man with a proper job and a smart uniform, whereas they were just a couple of kids, ridiculously knowing that they had failed him when he needed them most. Max and Natchesa followed Inspector Bendica back to the helicopter. They clambered inside the fasten the inside and fastened themselves into their seats. The rotor spun faster. Following the inspector's orders, the helicopter lifted into the air and headed along the line of the coast, searching the island for any sign of a boy, a dog, or a boat. Max and Natchez had glanced at one another. They both knew what there was no 
that knew that there was no chance of fighting Tim or Girk. They are searching the wrong island. The end of chapter 40. Chapter 41. The guard paced slowly along the metal walkway, dreaming about his lunch. He didn't enjoy patrolling the cavern. It was monotonous and boring. Twice an hour, he paced the entire length of the walkways, glancing into every cell, making sure that the octopus weren't causing any trouble. They never were. If there had been any trouble, his job might have been more interesting. When a new prisoner arrived, he or she would usually struggle for a few days. The humans would scream and shout, begging to demanding to be set free. The animals howled and growled. Some beat the bars. Others tried to dig through the walls and the floor, but they soon gave up, realizing that escape was impossible. Despair sapped their strengths. The guard Pause for a moment outside the tiger's cage, hoping the huge beast might lift her head and look at him, but she didn't. She slumped on the floor too melancholy to move. The guard walked along the walkway past the goats, the dogs, the rabbits, and the monkeys. He hurried past the humans that lingered near the tortoise, staring through the bars at the extraordinary creatures. He never tried off looking at them. He walked down the staircase to the lowest level. There, these cells were reserved for the most recent arrivals. He walked past a pair of pigs. He stared at the jaguar just delivered from China, which was pacing round and round his kitchen. He strolled past the newest arrival, the boy who had been placed inside his cell a previous afternoon. And then he stopped. The guard's eyes widened. He stepped closer to the bars and stared into the cell. The boy was lying on the ground. He wasn't moving. He didn't even appear to be breathing. The guard panicked. He didn't know what to do. If the boy was dead, if the, boy was dead the guard knew exactly what would happen. He would be killed too. Aragolias paid great awards for good work, but he didn't feel like it inflicted terrible punishments for bad work. The guard stood there for a few more seconds, hoping against hope that the boy would roll over or sneeze or show some signs of life, but he just lay there, not moving, not bracing, apparently dead. There was only one thing to do. The guard pressed the blue button. The bar slid open. The guard was stupid. He knew the prisoners played tricks, but he had already seen this boy for himself. He wasn't big enough or strong enough to cause a threat. He wouldn't be able to hurt anyone. The guard stepped into the cell. He said, boy? There was no response. He spoke a bit louder. Hey, boy. There was still no response. The guard led on the cool concrete floor and put his hand on the boy's shoulder. He said, boy, what's wrong with you? Still, the boy didn't answer. The guard leaned forward and said, come on, boy, what's going on? Can you hear me? There was a sudden movement so fast that it seemed like a blur. The guard didn't even have time to react. He just felt a terrible pain in his eyes and nose. He grabbed his face, screaming, and fell to the ground. Tim waited until the last possible moment. He knew he would have only one chance. He was small and thin and weak. In a fair fight, he couldn't possibly defeat a gross ground man. He wouldn't even survive one punch. He waited, not moving, trying not to breathe, until he could feel the guard looming over him. From the sound of the guard's voice, Tim guessed where the guard's face might be. He lo- hoped he was right. If he was wrong, it wasn't even worth thinking about what would happen if he was wrong. He waited until the last possible moment. Then he reeled around, raised his right and hand and hurled the contents of the pepper pot into the guard's face. The guard scrabbled disturbedly at his eyes, trying to scrape away the source of the pain. His lips trembled. His nose stung as if they'd been beaten by thin webs. His eyes dribbled tears. tears. And then then he remembered the boy. He rolled over on the ground, reaching for the boy with both hands grabbing at the air, determined to get his revenge. But he was too quick. He dodged away from the guard's swirling arms, sprang to his feet, and ran for the door. Before the guard could even start to react, the sound of the 
sound of his footsteps, Tim had sprinted through the open doorway and started running down the metal walkway. Behind him, he could hear a roar of anguish and fury. The guard shouted for help. It would only take a few seconds for his colleagues to realize that something was wrong. Tim ran round the walkway. He sprinted past cells containing dogs, tortoises, and people, turning his head quickly to glance into each one, but there was no sign of Kirk. He ducked behind a stack of computers. He stopped, panting, trying to decide what to do next. He looked around. He was hidden behind a tall bank of electric equipment. Wires trailed across the floor. He could hear shouts and footsteps. The guard must have alerted his colleagues. Tim tried to sing how he could escape from the cavern. He had a terrific an exit and take a lift to the surface. Then he would have to get off the island and find help. If he managed to contact the police, they could come back to Calypso and see for themselves what Edward Goliath had done. Had done. But how would he get off the island? How could he even get out of the cavern, let alone find a way to cross the ocean? It's hopeless, said Tim. I might as well give up now, he said. I'll never get out or here alive, he said. And even if I do, I'll never get off the island. He sighed again, and then he remembered the tortoise. He thought of the first giant tortoise that he had seen, the one that got, had mistaken for a, a green rock. He remembered how Gurg had run across the clearing. I'm not going to give up now, said Tim. I have to find a way out of here. I have to rescue the giant tortoise and stop Ergolia's experimenting on them. He turned to the left, then the right, searching his surroundings, trying to decide which way to go. To the right, there was a line of cages, packed with mice and rats. To the left, just a few paces away, there was a doorway that he recognized. It led into the control room. Tim had an idea. He smelled. Yes, he thought, that's a pretty good idea. He hurried to the doorway and glanced inside. The control room was empty. The guards must have gone to help their colleges. He went into the room. He stared at the panel which controlled every aspect of life inside the cavern. There must have been a hundred buttons and leaves of different shapes, sizes, and colors. None of them was marked. Tim had no idea which did what. Some must have opened doors, others must have controlled the lights, the temperature, the floor, flow of hot and cold air. Given more time, Tim could have taken a scientific approach, pressing each button in turn, checking what happened, but he didn't have time to be sensible or rational. He knew that guards would be here any minute. Reinforcements will already be coming down from the surface. Working his way from one end to the panel of the other, he pressed every button and pulled every lever. For a moment, nothing happened. Then there was chess. chess. The panel lit up. The dials flicked, flickered. A siren sounded, then another and the third, all of the striking at top volume. Tim put his hands over his ears. The noise was unbearable. He hurried to the do door and looked at the cavern. There, the chaos was even more extraordinary. Both flick and flick on and off. Doors opened and shut. Water gushed through pipes, air freezed through tubes. The air was filled with a catch up of extremely sounds, getting louder with every passing second, footstep shots, barking yells, a gunshot, a piercing scream, the roar of metal, the screech of steel all jumbled together. Every cell had opened, every animal had been set free. Some of them were too depressed, weak or tired that they couldn't bring themselves to move. They just sat in the in their cells, staring at the open doorway, wondering what had happened to the steel bars, not bothering to escape. But others ran. Dogs dashed along the metal walkways. Rats scrambled and up and down, 
the stairs. Monkey swung from platform to platform. Ghost wandered across the floor, stopping to chew the computer wires or chomped through a shelf of papers. And whether you looked, there were mice. Brown mice and white mice, big mice and small mice, fat mice and thin mice, dancing on the computers, paddling through the door pools of water, disparaging down corridors, searching every part of the cavern. Some of the mice had spent their entire lives inside a tiny little cage. However, now, for the first time, they are tasting freedom. Guards and scientists are printed across the floor and along the walkways. The guards were trying to impose odd order, firing shoot shots into the air, forcing animals and prisoners back into the cells. The scientists were trying to save their research. Sun pulled computers away from ga gushing streams of water. Others slammed the doors of cages to stop mice escaping. Some of now, none of them had time to notice a boy standing in a darkened doorway watching the chairs with a quiet smell on his face. Tim turned his head from side to side, looking for a road through the confusion, trying to decide which way to run. And then he frowned. He had realized that he couldn't get out of here. Not yet. Not alone. First, he had to find Gurk. Tim took a couple of pieces into the cavern and peered upwards at the metal wa walkway, searching for any sign of a small black and white dog. The end of chapter 41. Chapter 42. The tiger opened her eyes and lifted her hand. She could hear strange noises. She could smell unexpected scents. Something had changed. At the edge of her vision, she glimpsed some movement. She turned her head and looked through the doorway. There was a goat standing in the corridor. It stared at her, then blinked twice and padded away. The tiger blinked. She noticed that something had changed. There was usually big steel bars blocking the doorway, preventing her from leaving, protecting anyone who came down the corridor to bring her food or ex inspect her, but the bars had gone. Her cell had no door. If she wanted to leave, she could walk out now. She laid her head on the concert again. For the for that a year now, she had been confined to this cell. She had been captured in the jungle by a hunter and sold to other Goliaths, then put in a crate and transported to Calypso Island by ship and helicopter. For a year, she had seen nothing but these wolves and the people who walked down the door corridor past her cell. Every day at the same time, her meal was delivered. Day by day, she had lost any incision of life. She ate and slept and lay on the concert. Concrete. That was her life, eating, sleeping, dozing, doing nothing. When she, she was first confined in the cell, she used to piece around and round in circles, walking miles every day, but she had eventually stopped even doing that. Now, she just lay on the floor and dozed. By the, day by day, week by week, she had forgotten the jungle, her home. She had forgotten how to hunt the ha and how to run. There was another movement in the corridor. A white mouse ran along the floor, its nose wrinkling, sniffing, sniffing. The mouse was followed by another and then two more, then, and then a dog which glanced through the open doorway as the tiger growled briefly and hurried away. Deep in the tiger's memory, a vision stirred, a memory of chasing animals through the jungle. She remembered catching her own foot, sprinting through his, the trees, wading through rivers, clambering up mountains, and plunging down valleys. It felt, it had felt good. She remembered that now. She hauled Herself, her feet, and took a few unsteady steps toward the open doorway. The end of chapter 42. Chapter 43. One of the guards called the mansion and spoke to Toby Connaught, explaining that the prisoners had escaped. Toby Connaught electric the rest of the guards, ordering reinforcements to proceed immediately to the cavern, then left the mansion and ran across the guards to the helicopters. On the lawn, Andrew Goliath's helicopter was already to take, ready to take off. Goliath was standing on the grass discussing a few final preparations with the mechanics. They had been making some modifications to the, his helicopter, shedding some spare weight, making it even faster. 
Tommy Conrad interrupted their conversation to explain what had happened. Goliath did not take the news well. His face turned bright red with fury. He cancelled his helicopter flight. I'm not going to leave the island until that boat has been cut, he said, even if I have to catch him myself. Tim stood in the open doorway, wondering what to do. He did not know which way to run. He did not know whether to climb up the stairs or run round the walls or stay here, hoping to see some sign of Kirk. He watched the scene of Chaya swiftly engulfing the carpet. In just a few seconds, a calm and secure scientific laboratory had been turned into a jungle running with wild beasts. All the doors had opened. Every prisoner had been set free. The cavern was packed with noise and movement. Mice changed across the computers. Dogs chased rats along the walkways. Goats chewed wires. Monkeys swung down the star- stairways. A giant tortoise slowly lifted its enormous head and peered at the chairs with big black eyes. But there was no sign of Grook. The doors opened. Four guards emerged from the lift and started running. They sprinted down the corridor, emerged through the open door, and ran along. Along the walkway. Each of the guards was armed with a machine gun. They had been issued with strict orders. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They turned their heads from side to side, searching for the boy. Find him, Toby Connor has said. Whether you do find him, I want that boy. Dead or alive, I don't care. Just get the boy. The guards ran fast. They charged down the staircase and ran along the next level. They had a routine. One by one, they checked every cell, making sure it was empty. They found no sign of the boot. And then, just before they checked the last cell on the level, all four guards stopped. Right ahead of them, there was a tiger. They could have lifted their guns, pulled the triggers, and shot the tiger, but they were too shocked to move. They just stood there, mouths wide open, hands hanging by their sides, staring in astonishment. The tiger took advantage on their induction. With a roar, she leaped through the air. Chasing goats was fun. Chasing dogs was fun too. But chasing humans, that was what she really wanted to do. Humans had snatched her from the jungle, transported her across the sea, and locked her in this dungeon. She hated humans. Her mouth opened, her sh- sharp white teeth dripping saliva. She sprinted down the walkway. The four guards dropped their guns and ran. For the first time, Tim wondered whether dogs were cleverer than humans. He had been standing in the doorway trying to think of some way to find Kirk. He had stared around the caravan, observing the signs of chaos and destruction. Feeling scared and lonely and completely helpless, he had even wondered whether to escape alone or and save her himself, hoping that Gurg would find his own way out. He had looked left and then right and then left again, trying to imagine what was the best course of action and soon realizing that he didn't have a clue what to do. And then Gurg just appeared. He sprinted across the door and threw himself into Tim's arms. Gert stuck out his tongue and licked Tim's face, covering her lips and cheeks and nose with doggy saliva. Ah, said Tim, squealing. Stop, stop, that tickles. But he didn't push Gert away. Someone, somehow, Gert had known how and where to find him. He had negotiated the stairways and the walkways. He had dodged the guards and the prisoners. And best of all, he had known where to go. While Tim stood in his, this doorway, hopeless and bewildered, Gert had somehow managed to find him. Dogs were definitely cleverer than humans. Tim put Gert on the ground. He wiped his face with his sleeve. He said, let's get out of here, okay? Girk looked at him, barked twice, and wagged his tail. Tim, looked, Tim took that to mean yes. Together, Tim and Girk ran across the carbon's floor. The end of chapter 43. Chapter 44. In the bar- cat- barracks, six guards were lounging around, playing cards when the siren sounded. They sprang to their feet and grabbed their guns. The radio bust, giving them a simple order. Get down to the caravan. Find the boy. Now. They ran out of the 
barracks. On the other side of the harbor, they clamber aboard the wagon and wheeze straight down the tracks to the cavern. At the end of the tracks, the wagon stopped. The guards jumped out. The door swung open. The six guards poured into the cavern, their guns raised, ready to shut. And then they just stood there, their mouths open. Their eyes blinking in amazement, unable to believe the sense of chaos that confronted them. None of them turned around. None of them noticed what was happening behind them, which was why none of them saw a small boy and a dog creeping along the wall, sneaking through the doors and clambering inside the wagon. Tim pressed the button. The wagon shot along the track. Tim and Gurg sat on the wooden beach bench and watched the walls flashing past. When they reached the end of the turner, two doors slid open automatically. The wagon whooshed out of the turner and sped down the quay. quay. Under the wheels, a switch clicked, disturbing the current. The wagon rolled slowly to the halt. As soon as the wheels stopped returning, Jim jumped out, followed by Girk. They sprinted round the harbor. The sun was rising in the sky and the air was hot. After a few paces, Tim was sweated and Girk was panting. Moored in the harbor, just as Tim had remembered from his previous visit, there were six powerful speedboats, a pair of small yachts, and massive white cruiser. The Fountain of Yas. Several sailors were working on the cruiser's deck, polishing brass and co coiling ropes. None of them noticed Tim or Girk. Tim would have preferred to the to board the biggest speedboat because it would go fastest as he was worried that he wouldn't know how to start his engine. Instead, he ran around the quay to a small speedboat which looked quite similar to Beach Boat. Tim sprang between the shore and the boat. Girk followed him. He jumped they jumped into the cabin. Staring at the deal, dials and levers, Tim was relieved to see that the controls were just about the same as the controls in Beach's boat. Each even better, the key was sitting in the ignition. The speedboat was attached to the quay by two ropes, looped around cleats and its two and its bow and stern. Tim unlooped the ropes and let them drop into the water. He jumped back into the cabin and turned the key. The engine coughed, coughed again and spluttered into life. Now, said Tim, I have to remember exactly what to do. Tim notched the throttle. The engine snarked. The, he pulled the throttle farther downwards. The engine roared and the boat zoomed forward. The hull banged against the boat on the left, leaving a dent and banged ag again against the boat on the right, leaving uh, another dent that speed sped out of the harbor, leaving a foamy white wake on the surface of the water. On the deck, of the fountain of youth, a couple of the sailors turned round, alerted by the sound of the engine. They peered across the harbor. For a moment, neither of them could believe what they were seeing. Then one of the sailors ran to fetch the, his boots, and the other shouted at him, ordering him to stop. Over the noise of the engine, Tim couldn't hear what the sailor was shouting. Even if he had been able to hear, he wouldn't have cared. He had more important things to worry about. Tim pulled the throttle as far as it would go. The engine churned the waves, spitting foam. The boat leaped forward, cutting through the water. The strong wind swept over Tim, almost blowing the hairs off his head and grabbed at Girk, threatening to pick them up and throw him out of the cabin. Tim knew he didn't have much time. They would soon be coming after him. He turned the front of the boat to face the open water and headed away from Calypso. As the boat emerged from the protection of the harbor, the waves grew larger. The boat was thrown from side to side. Tim clung to the steering wheel. Gerg struggled from one side of the cabin to the other, despite trying to keep his balance. The ocean st stretched ahead of them, vast and empty. On the horizon, Tim could see a few Tinka see a few slim dark ships. He hoped they were the nearest islands. He turned the wheel and pointed the boat towards the island which looked nearest. Edward Goya sprinted across the lot. The, 
Mechanics. Mechanics were preparing the helicopters. The pilots were huddled in a group of, and several guards had assembled, carrying their weapons. But no one has actually doing anything. Any minute, the boy in the boat was getting farther away from the island, but no one was making any effort to stop him. There, there was an old English saying that Goliath had always lacked. He heard it for the first time about fifty years ago, spoken by. A teacher at his school, and it had lodged in his brain. In the fifty years since then, he had probably spoken those nine words to himself almost every day. If you want something done right, do it yourself. That's absolutely true," said Golias. "It was true fifty years ago, and it's still true today." He clicked his finger. Guards at one of his guards. Give me that. He pointed at the guard's machine gun. The guard stared at him, speechless with surprise. Come on, come on," said Goliath. "Give it to me." Yes, sir. The guard lifted the star over his head and handed the gun. Handed the gun to Goliath. Goliath grabbed the gun and ran across the grass to the, his helicopter. He clambered inside, put his headphones over his ears, and tucked the machine gun between his feet. A minute later, the helicopter was airborne and heading towards the ocean. If you want something done right, said Goliath, do it yourself. A wave crashed against the side of the boat, sending a cold spray into the cabin, soaking Tim and Gurk. Gurk yelled. He wasn't having fun. He was cold, wet, and seasick. He scrambled to the back of the cabin. Tim wasn't having fun either. He was cold, wet, seasick, and scared. He gripped the steering wheel with both hands, using all his strength to keep the boat facing forward. He was struggling to control the boat. The wind and the water were his enemies. They used every tactic to disarm and disable him. They ba- they bashed him and notched him, spat at him and soaked him, slapped him and shoved him. Water fell in the bottom of the cabin. Tim wanted to scoop it overboard with a bucket, but he didn't care. Their lad go off the wheel. Once more, he glanced behind, looking back the way that he had gone. He had come. The island was shrinking quickly. His wa his was still the only boat in the sea. Perhaps he wouldn't be followed. Perhaps he was free. And then, from the top of the island, he saw a small speck lifting into the air. From there, it looked no bigger than a mosquito, which it was. Each second, the speck grew lo- larger. Tim felt a sudden rush of terror. He knew exactly what the speck was. He turned at face forward. The ocean was ahead of him. The nearest island looked so no closer. He never reached it in time. Tim pulled the throttle, hoping against hope that the engine would release more power and steer towards the horizon. Tim looked over his shoulder once more. The speck was bigger now. It was approaching fast. In a minute or two, it would be overhead. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't alter a helicopter. The boat was too slow. He couldn't hide. He and Gerg were standing in an open boat, floating in the middle of the ocean. They were completely exposed. What could he do? The end of chapter forty-four. Chapter forty-five. Over the noise of the boat's engine, Tim could hear another noise, a fear, fierce humming. It sounded like a fly. Buzzing against a window pane, trying to get out of the house. Tim knew what the noise meant. He looked up. The helicopter was swooping through the sky, heading directly towards the boat. It was so close that Tim could clearly distinguish every detail of the undercarriage. Through the helicopter's open door, Tim could see the pilot hunched over the controls. Even from his distance, he recognized Edward Golias. Golias held the helicopter steady with one hand and reached down with his other hand. He mo- removed something that had been lying beside his feet. His feet, something that looked like a walking stick. As the helicopter swept overhead, Goliath poked the stick out of the window and pointed it at the boat. A burst of gun- gunfire came from above. Tim threw himself down and rolled across the cabin. Bolts sprinted through the water and along the deck. A line of holes appeared in the deck. This wheel spun. The boat rolled. Ha- 
have less light from side to side, who foam and spray feeds through the air and splash into the carbon, covering Tim with water, soaking him completely. If he stayed with this, Tim realized he didn't have a chance. He jumped up, ran across the cabin, and grabbed the wheel. He tried to control the boot. Then he realized that something was missing. No, not something. Someone. Where was Kirk? Tim turned around. He looked up and down the cabin. To his horror, he realized he was alone. Kirk had disappeared. Had it been swept overboard, Tim let go of the wheel and ran to the side of the boat. He stared at the ocean, searching the huge waves, but he couldn't see any sign of a small black and white dog. He ran to the other side of the boat, but he couldn't see Kirk there either. Where had he gone? Tim shouted, Kirk! The only response was the buzzing of the helicopter's rotors. He looked up. Goliath had reeled through the air and was coming back for a second shot at the boat. Tim shouted, Kirk! Woof woof! Tim turned around. What was that noise? What was that just the sound of the waves crashing against the side of the boat? Woof woof! Yes, there it was again. He'd heard something. He was sure he had the sound of a dog barking for help. But where was it coming from? To see the waves? Which direction? Woof woof! This time, the he, team heard exactly where the noise was coming from. He ran to the stern of the boat and dropped down to the deck. Gerg had crawled into a cupboard at the back of the cabin. He was lying on a pile of red cushions, shivering. Tim lifted his head and stared at Tim. He lifted his head and stared at him. It was quite obvious from the expression that Gerg was cold, cross, and sick, say, and he, he wanted to go home. I'm really sorry, said Tim, but I don't know if you're ever going to go home. Gerg barked, woof, woof. Tim said, what's that supposed to mean? Gerg barked again, woof, woof. Tim said, I don't know what you're trying to say. Gerg barked a third time. Woof, woof. Behind Gerg, nestling among the cushion, Tim saw three red tubes. When he realized what they were, his eyes widened. You're a genius, said Tim. Gerg, you're a genius. The end of chapter 45. Chapter 46. The helicopter flew lower and lower, barely skimming the surface of the waves. Goliath aimed the gun at the boat, preparing to fire. This time, he was determined to hit the boy. This time, he would not miss. If you want something done right, he whispered to himself, do it yourself. His finger tightened on the trigger. As the helicopter approached, Tim stood in the middle of the boat, his feet apart, and pointed the red flare into the sky. It had a simple design. You held the body of the flare in one hand and pulled a sword cord with the other. He wasn't sure, quite sure what would happen when he pulled the cord. The flare might explode or ignite. Ignite. He might blow his hand off, off or lose an eye. But even losing an eye is better than being shot by a madman with a machine gun. Tim aimed the fl uh, flare at the helicopter's cabin, hoping it would snag against the rotors or smash the windscreen, forcing Goliath to turn around the return to the island. The helicopter came closer and closer. Tim forced himself to wait until the past possible moment. He stayed standing still, a completely exposed target. Un until the helicopter was directly overhead, then he pulled the cord. There was a fist and a bang. The flare shot into the air, leaving a tear of smoke. Of smoke. It means the helicopter continued up, up, up into the sky and exploded in the floating ball of bright red smoke. Inside the helicopter, Goliath panicked. He didn't understand what had happened. Did the boy have a bazooka, a rocket launcher, a mortar, a mortar? He pulled his pulled the helicopter upwards, away from the boat. 
and circled back towards the island, putting a safe distance between himself and the boy. He glanced back, checking that he wasn't being attacked again, and saw a trail of red smoke stretching into the sky immediately. He understood what it was. Goliath laughed. He was impressed. The boy wasn't an idiot, firing a flare. That was a clever idea. Clever, but not clever enough. Goliath turned the helicopter around and prepared a second attack. Max was the only person to sit. He shouted, what was that? He was sitting in the police helicopter with Natchez, Mr. and Mrs. Bolt, Inspector Bandica, Dr. White, and the pilot. Over the noise of the engine, no one had hear, heard what he said. He tugged Natchez's sleeve and shouted louder, did you see that? She sh shouted back, Did I see what? That, he pointed through the window. Natchez turned and stared. Through the helicopter's window, she could see a distant tiny trail of red smoke faded in the sky. He must have, it must have been a several miles away. She shouted, What's that? I don't know, shouted Max. He looked around the helicopter. No one else had even the had seen the smoke. They were too busy staring down at Arbringen Island, searching the trees and the rocks off for any sign of a boy, a dog, or a boat. Tim grabbed another flare. The helicopter stood over the waves. Tim stared upwards, watching the roads, rotors and the shape of Goliath hunch over the controls and could clearly see the black machine gun in Goliath's hand. The end of the gun clacked with bright light. There was a rattle of explosions. Bullets smacked into the boot, puncturing fireball, fire glass and metal, spending sparks in every direction. Tim waited, trying not to panic, letting the helicopter come closer and closer and closer. When he couldn't wait another second, he pulled the cord. The Fire spat and roared and shot into the air, leaving a trail of smoke. It missed the helicopter, reached up, up, up into the sky, even higher than the first, and exploded in another cloud of scarlet smoke. The, this time, Max and Natchesa were waiting for the flare. As soon as the red smoke exploded in the sky, they shouted to others, drawing their attention to it. Then the malls turned around. So did Inspector Bandicoot ever realized immediately what the flare meant. Someone was in trouble. The, uh, perhaps that someone was Tim. Inspector Bandicoot issued a quick order to the pilot. The helicopter cleared through the air, changing direction, leaving the island and heading across the ocean towards the source of the flare. Goliath smelled. He was enjoying himself. The life of a pilot there is often boring meetings, lunches, dinners, flying from New York to Tokyo and Sydney to London and and then back to New York again. Oh, it might sound glamorous, but it's actually it's got exhausting and irritating and quite dull. This was much more fun. He read the machine gun. Down below, he could see the boat bobbing on the water and the two small figures inside the cabin, uh, the boy and the dog, their little faces lift, staring at the sky in his right hand, the boy was holding another flare. Goliath admired the boy's spirit. He liked someone who fought back. A pity, said Goliath, that I'm going to have to kill him. He eased the controls forward and swooped across the ocean. There was one flare left. It was his last chance. When the final flare was gone, Tim had decided he would throw himself overboard. He didn't want to wait here like a condorman man in front of a firing squad. He would plunk into the sea holding Gurk in his arms and try to stay afloat. He might groan or get eaten by sharks. But that was better than sitting here in this boot, a sitting target being shot to pieces. He held the flare, the he held the, the flare in his right hand and the cord in his left. He waited for the helicopter to come closer. He tried to ignore all the other sounds, the sound of sensations, the roaring engines, the buzzing rotors, the cold, the wet, the waves, throwing the boats from side to side and concentrated on the helicopter. This is it. So Tom, this is my last chance. He pulled the cord. The end of chapter 46. Chapter 47. The flare fizzed through the air. It flew straight into the helicopter, banged against a cert behind the pilot's seat, and exploded. Scarlet smoke filled the interior of the helicopter. Goliath couldn't see. He got hardly breath. 
he wrestled with the controls, the helicopter lurched and plowed with a wild horse trying to throw a rider off its back. Goliath dropped the gun. It slid across the floor, fell out of the helicopter, and stumbled through the air. There was a small splash. Then the gun was gone, sinking down to the bottom of the sea. Goliath didn't even notice. He had no he had too many other things to worry about. His eyes down, his legs aged. He didn't know where he was going or what he was doing. The helicopter flew to the left, then the right, lurching desperately from one side to the other, soaring into the air, then plunging down towards the sea. Through the smoke, Goliath could suddenly see the ocean rushing towards him. He pulled the controls violently. The helicopter twisted and shuddered and almost managed to lift into the air again, but the rotor on the tail, just a single rotor, scrapped the foaming crest of the wave and snapped off. The removal of that one rotor was enough to condemn the helicopter. The entire machine swiveled and tipped over and collapsed into the sea. The windscreen smashed, all the rotors shattered. Sparks flew, metal crunched, like a mosquito slapped by a mass pump. The helicopter crumpled into the water. Goliath screamed and struck with his seat back, trying to free himself. The full tank cracked open, liquid spilled out. As soon as the film met a sprag, there was a loud bang and a huge ball of orange flame leaped into the air. A great gust of head heat flashed across the water, knocking Tim and Gurg backwards, throwing them from one end of the cabin to the other. They lay there for a second, stunned. Wave after wave struck the side of the boat. Kirk rolled over and licked his burnt fur. Tim touched his sighing eyes, seeing eyebrows and scratched skin. His face felt as if he had been lying in the sun all day. He sat up and peered over the side of the boat. He saw flaming oil and black smoke and, in the midst of the burning wreckage, a human body floating face down in the water. The end. Of chapter 47. Chapter 48. Six days after the death of Aragoyas, a blue boat chugged across the ocean. Four people were inside the boat, four people and a small dog. Beach stood at the wheel, a cigar clamped between his teeth, clouds of grey smoke surrounding his face. Max and Nechesa and Tim sat in the cabin taking turns to peer at the ocean through the binoculars, searching for whales. Gert lay at their feet, dozing. Mr. and Mrs. Bold had decided to stay in the hotel and spend the day beside the pool reading their books. When the bull reached Calypso, Beach moored against the quay. He told the children to go ahead without him. He was going to stay in his boat, he explained, when the three children had jumped ashore, followed by Gurk. Beach stretched out in the shade, pulled his cap over his face, and fell asleep. Together, the three children walked around the quay and clambered up the steps that led from from the harbor to the mansion. Gurk stopped to sniff a fishy smelling bucket and then hurried after them. At the top of the steps, they found the road and walked slowly towards the center of the island. They had been walking for 10 or 15 minutes when Tim pointed and said, There, to look. Do you see? The others stopped and looked. Natura said, What are you supposed to be looking at? That, said Tim. What? This that sings that likes a green rock. Gurk bounded ahead, his tail wagging, and barked loudly. Woof, 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 woof. Surprised by the noise, the giant turtle slowly lifted its head. Tim, Max, and Natchez all gathered around, looking at the giant tortoise, inspecting its big head and its black eyes and its plump feet and its enormous shell. The tortoise were safe now. The police had emptied Goliath's laboratories. His prisoners were taken to hospitals and zoos. The tortoise stayed behind. There was no reason for them to leave the island. Goliath had never made a will because he hadn't believed that he was ever going to die. His six ex-wives, seven children, and nine grandchildren were going to spend the next few decades suing one another 
to decide how to divide all this money. The government of the Seychelles had decided to take control of Calypso until the lawsuits finish and convert the island into the nature ref- reserve. It's always impossible to predict the future. Anything might happen. A tidal wave might sweep the Seychelles away. The seas might rise so high that all the island are some summered, submerged. Thousands of miles away, a pair of idiotic police politicians might decide to have a war and destroy the entire planet with their bombs. But let's hope Calypso is spread this or any other disasters. And then with a bit of luck, the giant tortoises will be able to continue living peacefully on the island for a long, long time. The end of Girk Operation Tortoise by Joshua Dodder.